Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to today's meeting of Planning Committee A. Uh, I'm Councillor Johnny Crawshaw, and I will be the chair for this evening, uh, and, and indeed for the rest of this year. It makes it sound like it's just a temporary thing. Um, I'm joined uh, this evening on my right-hand side by Becky Eads, who is the Head of Planning, and she'll be here throughout the meeting, as will uh, Jane Meller as the Democracy Officer, and Sandra Brannigan as the Senior Solicitor. Um, Councillor Fisher is the vice chair uh, this evening and uh, down each side of the table are the committee members. Um, we'll be joined for each item by uh, different officers who may be from um, highways or the, the planning officer who's dealt with the application and I'll introduce those officers as we reach each agenda item. Um, just in terms of housekeeping, if I could just ask everybody to make sure that their phones are turned off or on silent. Um, if you need the toilet at all uh, during the meeting, members of the public, you can uh, go through this door that's behind me. Committee members, you cannot leave the table whilst we're uh, dealing with an agenda item, but I will be taking adjournments uh, between each item, um, so there will be that opportunity. Um, and we're not expecting fire alarms, so if the fire alarms go off, then uh, we will help everybody to leave the room uh, by the appropriate, uh, appropriate place. Um, this meeting is a business meeting of the council that's being held in public, so as such it's not a public meeting. That means that there are specific points during which uh, people will be invited to come and give comments, but if I can ask anybody sat in the gallery to not try to um, contact or communicate with any members of the committee out with of those times, that would be very much appreciated, thank you. Um, and uh, if I just give uh, people a summary of how we handle each uh, application, um, both for the benefit of those in the room and anybody watching, um, what will happen is each time we come to a um, different application, the officers will talk us through the plans and give us any updates on those plans. Um, committee members can then ask questions on the specifics of the plans. We then have a section whereby anybody who's registered to speak can come and make a case or, or um, give us their views and committee members have the opportunity to ask questions there. Depending on anything that comes out of that or any further questions, um, members can then ask officers to clarify or um, ask for further information. And then we move into debate and that's the opportunity for committee members to uh, give their views about how they feel about the application, perhaps talk through any um, sticky points or anything that they, they um, feel strongly one way or another on it. And then we test the officer recommendation. So every application has a recommendation from the officers. The first thing that we do is test support for that recommendation. Um, should the recommendation not be accepted, then it's up to committee to decide how they then wish to uh, deal with the application. So uh, with all of that said, um, I can then move us on to uh, the apologies that we've received for this evening's meeting. Um, so we have two changes to the usual committee. Um, Councillor Hollier sends apologies and Councillor Fenton is attending in his place. And Councillor Kelly has sent her apologies and she's being substituted by Councillor Melly. So if I can move us then on to uh, agenda item one on the formal agenda, which is declarations of interest. So if I can invite anybody who has any interest to declare in relation to anything on this agenda. Councillor Fisher, I saw you first. Thank you. Um, with regard to uh, item 4C, um, I was present at the meeting uh, of Stranser with Turthorpe Parish Council when they considered this application, and I've been informed that I expressed some opinions, and therefore I should, therefore, I think, uh, not uh, take part in this, and I will leave the room as I could be classed as predetermined. Thank you, that's duly noted. And so when we do reach that agenda item, the committee will need to elect uh, another vice chair, but we'll handle that as we get to uh, that, that agenda item. Did I see Councillor Stewart? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's anything prejudicial or anything like that, but just in terms of the first um, sort of two items, uh, obviously as the ward member for Cotmanthorpe, um, I do regard them as both relating to Cotmanthorpe. The first one clearly on, on Moor Lane um, and the second one, Pike Hills Golf Club, does border Cotmanthorpe, um, even though it's within Ascom Bryan Parish. Um, I don't think there's anything prejudicial in terms of any sort of conversations I've had or anything I've said or done. Um, and two things first to that is I am also, I'm on the Ainsty Drainage Board and I don't know whether people declare that sort of thing. So obviously they've commented on 
on both applications. I've not actually, unfortunately, been able to attend either of the two meetings yet, and clearly I'm on there ward-wise rather than particularly enthusiastically. Uh, well, not unenthusiastically, but... Um, and and I'm, a, I'm a school governor at Cottonthorpe Primary School, who, again, a sort of, you know, the school get referenced in uh, what the housing in Moreland may or may not mean for them. Thanks, Councillor Stewart. I think that's all du duly noted, but um, I'm not seeing any uh, concerns being raised from the solicitor, so I, I think that that's all fine. Um, Councillor Merritt. Yes, uh, I'm non-pecuniary uh, uh, interest in as much as I'm a member of York Cycle Campaign and York Bus Forum, which obviously have uh, generalised interests in uh, transport issues. I'm not aware they've made any representations on either of these, on any of these applications. Okay, thank you. That's all duly noted. Um, so agenda item two is to uh, consider and approve the minutes of the last meeting of this committee, which was held on the 6th of July. So uh, is everybody happy that they're a true and accurate record? Yeah, seeing nods. Great. So we'll take those as they are. Um, agenda item three is the public participation on the general remit of the committee. Um, we've not had anybody register on the general remit of the committee, so I can move us on to agenda item four. And uh, we take these in A, B, C, D. This is where we go through all of the uh, applications. So uh, agenda item 4A is land to the southeast of 51 Moor Lane, Cotman Thorpe, York. So if I can uh, welcome Victoria Bell as the Development Management Officer. Um, I was going to say to the table, but you're at the table already. Um, and I don't know if it's yourself that's going to talk us through the updates and then and then the plans. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so there's a five page update in front of you. Um, I'll just go through the headlines briefly. Um, there's uh, we set out the Cotton Fork Cotman Thorpe Village Design Statement and we set out the relevant guidelines. Um, there is a revised, um, there's an adjustment to the public uh, realm contribution. So we're now only asking for the off-site sports provision um, as um, the site is providing on-site play and amenity space. We've received um, further information from the healthcare services and, and their contribution. So that will go towards a mixture of refurbishment and new build at the old school medical practice in Cotman Thorpe. We've received no objections from the North Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, since the writing of the report, we've received um, three further representations of objection. The points are set out. In the updates, we've also received an objection from Cotton Thorpe Parish Council. Um, again, the points are set out. Um, we request revisions to some of the conditions. So there's the plans condition. We've actually stated the, the plans that um, have been submitted. Um, condition 26, we've stated the landscape plan in there. Um, a revision to condition 30, which is the carbon emissions reduction uh, condition. And um, we also request an additional condition, which is the timing of the works with regards to birds and the Wildlife Countryside Act. Um, with regards to the planning balance, the additional consultee comments and representations have been assessed and the planning balance with the exception of the requested alterations to the conditions and the additional conditions set out above Together with the revised open space contribution, the recommendation is unchanged from the published report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I just want to double check because obviously there's, there's there's quite a bit of information there. Um, has everybody had time um, as they've arrived at the meeting just to have a look through that? Um, does anybody want a couple of minutes just to make sure that they've they've gone through it? I'm seeing nods that most people seem to be happy that they've they've had the time to read it. Okay, that's great. In which case, Becky. There's just one additional item that it's not on a, a written update. We are also going to ask for £14,000 as part of the 106 for monitoring of the site. That's It's just an omission on our part. We've accidentally forgot to put it on. Um, but that's standard for all housing developments that we ask for a monitoring fee. Right, I'll go to your plans. OK, so the, it's a full planning application for the erection of 75 dwellings. You can see the site location plan there in red. Um, existing properties that I'm just highlighting here, railway line. 
that's the draft local plan. You can see it in terms of its context of Cotman Thorpe here. That's the allocation. So the existing dwelling at 51 more lane, that's more lane as you can see, and that's the neighbouring properties to the north of the site that stood just inside. And again, stood further into the site, looking up towards the properties to the north. And then the site boundary with the railway line. And again, viewed from opposite side of the railway line there. And from the public right of way. So that's your proposed site layout plan. That's where you could see the existing properties up here. Access, pedestrian access route here, and then the main vehicular access in. As you can see here, a mixture of house types, all two storey. Um, just quickly run, these are all in your um, agenda packs for you to see, so you can see them there. And that's the landscape master plan, where you can see the landscaping proposed as part of the scheme. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. So, um, members, if you have any questions on anything specifically to do with the plans, um, this is the opportunity to ask them now, but um, broader questions we'll, we'll get to a bit further on. So, Councillor Merritt. Apologies if this is not the right place, but uh, it's the first time I've been on uh, planning for quite a long time. Um, first of all, um, there's reference to the status of the uh, uh, new local plan and its policies in a number of places, particularly in regards to the... so, so that is the sort of thing that we'll come to. Um, what, what we use this section for is just for very specific clarification around um, uh, things that are within the plan. So just to orientate yourself around the site, if there's a, right. for example, a question about a ridge height or, or those, those sorts of things. Right. Um, if it's a, a sort of a slightly broader um, issue, then there's the opportunity to raise that when we come to the more general questions. To raise it with officers. Right? Yes, yes, right. yes. Yeah, it, it's, it's a slightly new way of working, but uh, yeah. Councillor Nelson. Thank you. I also hope this is the right place to ask this question. Um, in that plan, it continues to show the, the trees being mostly sited on people's driveways. Uh, I suppose I just had wanted to query that that hasn't changed in any way based on the kind of, um, or that, have there been any discussions about reciting of trees or are they staying exactly where they are in the plans as they are now? The, the plan is showing where the trees are. That there's um, there's a bit in the report. Uh, I think the, um, the the intention was for some of the trees to be adopted, given that they're sort of between driveways and uh, in gardens. There isn't that differentiation between adopted highway and private space, so they're unlikely to be adopted. Yeah, so that, that's basically what I was asking. And, and with that being the case and with the discussion, the kind of feedback in these reports, none of those trees have moved onto clearly adopted no. highways. Thank you. Okay, no further questions at this point, uh, in which case um, we now move on to uh, the public speakers who've registered on this application. Um, so there's a couple of people registered to speak. Um, the first person on my list is Graham Orton. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, uh, who is from Cottonthorpe Parish Council. So if you want to come to the table, and uh, the way this works is you have three minutes to address the committee. I'll give you a heads up when you've got about 30 seconds left, unless it looks like you're drawing to a, to a close, in which case I'll try not to interrupt you. Um, but once you've finished, if you just stay at the table just for a moment, because there may be questions that members want to, to ask. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Graham Morton. I'm Chair of Cottonthorpe Parish Council. I'm here on behalf of Cottonthorpe residents to express our serious concerns regarding access to and from this proposed new development and the inevitable impacts of a significant increase in traffic through the heart of our village. Having looked at the planning committee report, Highway Network Management section page 13, this aspect does not seem to my mind to have been addressed adequately, or at least explicitly. There is talk of off-site highway improvements, but these seem to be limited to pedestrian crossings. What I believe is, need, is needed is a full survey of Moulin and an assessment to be agreed with officers of the improvements required to accommodate the increased traffic. The survey can be secured by a planning condition if necessary, and any improvements secured either by that condition or Section 106 agreements. 
For those not familiar with Cotman Tor, Moor Lane is a relatively narrow two-way cul-de-sac with properties on both sides of the road. Parking overspill means that many vehicles are parked at the curbside, making access rather difficult. It can best be described as a series of chicanes. As a result, current journeys along Moor Lane are often a stop-start affair as drivers have to negotiate parked vehicles, which is hardly ideal. The road itself is in very poor repair, a situation which has severely worsened over the last two years due to the high volume of heavy goods vehicles transporting equipment to and from the network rail depot at the end of Moor Lane, which is directly opposite the proposed development site. This depot was originally introduced as a temporary measure, but it is to become a permanent fixture. I doubt that this would have been factored into the highways network assessment, which predated this additional traffic burden. The junction of Station Road, Moor Lane and Main Street is a major cause for concern, especially when this very busy interchange will have to contend with, say, 120 extra journeys in the morning and a similar number each evening to service the new development. The junction is already congested with many cars and large vehicles transporting goods and heavy equipment, not to mention the regular bus service and school bus transport. Visibility end of station road is so poor that vehicles have no option but to emerge from the junction in order to get a better view of oncoming traffic. It's an accident waiting to happen, especially given the projected significant increase in journeys to and from the new development. I might add that this situation will surely become much worse in the near future, given the weight restrictions that are due to be introduced on the bridge into and out of Bishopthorpe. HGVs will have no option but to divert through Cotmanthorpe via Station Road and via the already busy and potentially dangerous junction with Moor Lane and Main Street. Under these circumstances, the during the course of their debate, I would invite members to ask highways officers and the planning officer to comment in detail on these traffic highway concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was absolutely bang on three minutes. I needn't have interrupted you. So so thank, thank you. <laughs> um, so members, did you have any points of clarification that you wish to raise with Mr. Orton? Not seeing any hands going up, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll we'll consider those uh, as part of the deliberations, the, the points you've raised. Um, so then, uh, if I could invite Liam Tate as the applicant in support, uh, if you'd like to come to the table. And again, you have three minutes to address the committee. Um, you can start on your own time, and I will try to give you a heads up when you've got about thirty seconds left. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, thank you for letting me speak in support of this application and your offers a recommendation for approval. I want to say a few words as the applicant, Barrett David Wilson Holmes, but your officers have provided a comprehensive committee report which outlines the scheme accurately and provides a thorough assessment of the proposals, which we wholly endorse. Um, the application site is a residential allocation within your emerging local plan, having consistently been identified as a suitable site for development in various iterations over the, the plan over the, over the last 10, 15 years. The site is also designated within the council, open the Cotton Thorpe's neighbourhood plan. Uh, proposals before you today have been in consideration for a considerable amount of time um, and it's, the scheme has been scrutinised by a range of consultees, all of which to provide valuable input into the final proposals. Uh, through various meetings, telephone calls and advice and specialists, we now have a scheme which is fully supported by all consultees. The proposed scheme provides a range of house types and sizes, including one, two, three and four bedroom properties, 30% of which are designated as affordable in line with the council's policy. Uh, you'll note the support has been offered by your housing officer in this regard. The scheme also provides pockets of open space, including a playground and areas of general amenity. Existing hedgerows are to be retained and provision has been made for new landscaping, resulting in the provision of 40% net gain in biodiversity. Uh, we acknowledge um, local residents have concerns regarding the use of more lane as the access um, and, and note the, the, the concerns are from residents mainly directly or adjacent to the site. Um, however, obviously the application has been uh, accompanied by a, a robust traffic assessment, which has been independently reviewed by your own qualified highways officers. Um, the report demonstrates the width of the carriageway is sufficient and um, with a minimal traffic flow as predicted would not result in detrimental impacts on the highway network. Um, members will also note from the report that the application will propose to secure the provision of circa £1 million in developer contributions, which will help um, expand the local primary school and the local doctor's surgery, and also uh, result in ecological upgrades to, to the nearby Ascombe Fog uh, Nature Reserve. 
Uh, in summary, the site has consistently been earmarked for residential development, both by the parish council and the city council. The proposal is fully compliant with all national and local policy. It will deliver much needed affordable housing. It will secure significant contributions to help fund local infrastructure. Um, and the, the application is supported by your officers and all external consultees. Um, a considerable amount of time has been invested prior to and following the submission application, developing these proposals, which meet the highest possible standards, taking into account all opportunities and constraints. And we therefore re respectfully request that your advice from your officers is followed and permission is granted. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, again, well timed in terms of uh, being pretty much on the dot three minutes there. So uh, that's, that's excellent. Um, it, again, if members have any questions, uh, Councillor Fenton and then Councillor Fisher, I'll come to you. Uh, thank you. The, <clears throat> the officer report on page 38 uh, covers the contribution that's requested for um, extra capacity at local GP surgeries. Um, and the um, we've received an update this uh, at the meeting explaining what that money will be used for. Uh, the report states that the request has been forwarded to the applicants and at the time of writing the report, officers had not received a response. Um, are you able to provide a response in terms of whether or not you accept that as a as a condition? That, that is agreed. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fisher. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you how many of the uh, dwellings have got heat pumps and solar panels on them, please. Um, none of the, none of the, well, that that level of detail hasn't been um, agreed yet. Obviously, there's a condition, it's condition thirty on, mm -hmm. on on the suggested conditions, which requires um, energy efficiency measures. So um, there's there's a range of of methods we can we can employ to to hit those um reductions in carbon emissions there's things like fabric first approach so that's looking at the level of insulation within the building um there's the use of solar panels there's a sort of use of heat pumps etc so until we get into the, the the sort of technical detail drafting up the technical um specifications of the dwellings um we haven't yet decided what will be employed to to meet the, the relevant standards um but there's a like like i said there's a range of different things we can look at heat pumps solar panels fabric first thicker walls and etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. so i obviously can't make a firm commitment on what what will employ um on this scheme at, at this stage but obviously that information will come in to, to satisfy that relevant condition I think it's condition 30 from memory but you haven't ruled out using those methods as a, as, as and when appropriate P possibly yeah possibly, possibly. We, have, we have we have we have done them on other sites um it, it's something we, we we do do on other sites but like i say and until we get into the sort of the technical detail we we again we apply separate consultants who look at the most efficient ways of, of meeting those relevant energy efficiency standards um that might be looking at like i say looking at the, the, the fabric of the building looking at level of insulation looking at, at various different methods so it's it's one of the tools we can use so yeah it's not a bit of a round the houses answer but it's it's something we could look at as part of the, the final scheme correct thank you hey councillor Eyre. Yeah, I've just been doing the calculations. It's around the mix of affordables. Uh, how did you come to the percentage ratio across the different types of dwellings? So you've got over 60% of the two beds being affordables. What's what the rationale behind the, the way that they've been split out? There's been quite a lot of discussion on that with your housing officer. And um, obviously the council's got their own housing mix requirements. So we've had very much a, a clear steer from your housing officer working with them, in, in particular over the last sort of Two, two months really to come up with the, the final mix um so, so so it's been very much led by them okay any further questions from members councillor merritt yeah the um new local plan sets a minimum density of 30 uh, dwellings per hectare uh, sorry 35 dwellings per hectare uh, this is quite a bit short of that uh, in density terms um, what have been the considerations from your end in terms of arriving at this uh, low low density? It, it's a very good question. Um, so this, like I said in my speech, this application has been in for, um, I think it was 2019 it was submitted. And if members have looked through the history, I think the, the first application was submitted for about 97 dwellings, I believe. 
and through various iterations, through various um, amendments to the layout to address things like biodiversity net gain, which, which has, has, has come into fruition relatively recently, to make address concerns in relation to separation distances to existing properties, to address things like parking concerns, to address things like frontage parking. The density has come down in various iterations. So I appreciate that the, the local plan sets a, a minimum density of 35 dollars per hectare. But I think the, the policy acknowledges that that then subject to site constraint. So, as a as a as a as a house builder, we we build anywhere from twenty five to forty dwellings per hectare on various different, essentially beyond that, at various different sites. But it very much depends on the site constraints and 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 how things are, yeah, how how things need to be addressed really. So, so in, in, sorry, in response to in response to your question, we, we could build, we could, we could put forward a scheme that, that is a higher density, more, more dwellings on the site, more closer to, to the allocation number of 92, but that would then result in um loss of public open space, or it would result in, in more frontage parking, or the, the other option is we, we look at the, the housing mix. So where you've got a four-bed house, we could we could drop a four-bed and put two two beds on there. But I think. Working with officers and consultancies over the last six, 12 months in particular, I think the scheme before you now, members, is strikes that balance between design and all the different constraints. Thank you. Does that answer your question in full, Councillor Mary? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah. I've got a second question. Uh, okay, yeah, go for it. Um, can I just be clear? Um, the recommendations uh, refers to highway uh, issues in the um section 106 um a number of requests were made uh in paragraph 3.6 in terms of travel planning and a package of incentives for sustainable travel uh for new dwellings uh, has have, have you agreed uh to those in terms of uh uh, uh, the section 106 aspect just just to be clear all the section 106 requests that have been made by officers i think the, the committee report has, has predated all that agreement but that they're all now agreed correct right. yeah so all the section 106 monies where it's referred to are, are agreed correct so that's the education the highways the the nhs yeah. um the, the travel plan measures etc yes yeah we just so page 45 of the report at, at um 7.0 under the recommendation um there's there's references to some of the specifics in, in this and then some of it gets picked up through the detail of the 106 agreements right yeah okay thank you uh councillor nelson i saw your hand next thank you um i just wanted to uh ask a little bit more about some of those uh biodiversity sort of things that have been raised specifically um i know that uh is it yorkshire wildlife so um ask and bob uh talked about putting a ditch in somewhere uh specifically aimed at kind of biodiversity uh encouragement uh and also you you just said all the hedgerows were retained and i think at some point i'd read that and somewhere else i've read that there were some hedges that weren't being retained so i just wanted to confirm all the existing hedgerows are being retained they're, they're being retained wherever feasible i think there's there's a there's obviously the site access we'd have to punch through and there's various private drives and we have to punch through but we are proposing further hedgerows to to mitigate that loss so again bng is split into uh habitat in terms of habitat for, for biodiversity but it's also split into hedgerows so i think we're, we're providing, i don't i've got the figures in front of people providing a, a positive um gain in respect to both so the hedgerows number percentage is, is going up so and will they be on um sort of adopted not private land some of those um, new ones you, you can see on the layout plan so the majority would be on the the, the adopted higher the area of public open space in particular um in the north obviously that hedgerow um would would be adopted um sorry let me correct myself when i say adopted as a public open space would be wouldn't be adopted by the council because that's not something that the, the council do anymore it would be under a private management company so it wouldn't be within private residences it would be part of the private management company so residents will pay into a pot of money which would then maintain them in, in perpetuity can i ask one more element of this you, you can say somewhere about just, mute. sorry just one second council nelson and councillor is yours on this topic as well Okay, um, Councillor Nelson, is yours, is yours directly on that yeah, as well? Yeah, just within that, there was one other thing in, that I just wanted to ask about, which was, sorry, Councillor, 
uh, newts. It says somewhere about there being newts on this site. Um, is that confirmed? And has there's, something there's not to... newts on the site, so I don't know if members have been to site. It's a completely bare arable field at the minute. So there's no ponds or anything with with newt potential. The, there's there's ponds and various ditches that we've looked at as part of the the wider area um, to, to 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 look at the presence of newts, but there isn't. There's nothing being found, so there's been there no impacts on newts. Thank you. And Councillor Ayer. Yeah, it's just that reference to the management fee. Would that be a flat management fee across the whole site? Obviously, with 30% affordable, people are applying for affordable homes because they can't really afford. You know, so that for them to be levied the same charge as everybody else, maybe. It's it's, 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 it's um it, it'll be calculated on sort of bedroom sizes, so it'll be different for different properties. So one bed will pay different for a for a two bed, but in terms of market slash affordable, it'd be the same rate. Which which is pretty standard for developments across across the country. That's that's how it's how it's dealt with. That, that, but obviously, you've got that issue that somebody who's paid perhaps six seven hundred thousand pounds to buy the house is paying the same as somebody else who's on a social rent. Mm. I, I get your point. I get your point. But it's that that's pretty standard for obviously the the people living in the affordable units have the same demands and needs, and when we use the site in the same ways as the market market dwelling. So um, that that's just a way of of collecting funds to then fund the the, the maintenance of the, the public areas if you like uh, i'm just going to invite um sandra brannigan just to, to comment on that as well um i hope this is helpful i might be able to provide some limited assistance on this point because i remember drawing up um, with the housing officer on a different site a year or so ago a section 106 agreement and my recollection is i can't remember the detail but in terms of the um, management fee, I think there was definitely some sort of adjustment that was taken into account in terms of the, the occupants of the affordable housing would had. I don't know if they paid the full management fee or, or some lesser amount. It was something that was picked up by the housing officer and could be picked up in the section one six. That saves me asking you that again in a minute. Sorry? I was going to ask you that in the next All section, right. so that saves me doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think it was also possibly a topic of some housing scrutiny as well. So uh, it may be something that members want to, to return to um, when it's appropriate. Um, are there any further questions? Uh, sorry, Councillor Stewart, I did see your hand and I'd forgotten you. So there you go. There is. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, I was sort of thinking it was a question to officers, but um, I'll say the question and then we can sort of see because it might want better for Liam. Um, it's just about the, the um, operational hours condition if this development were to be allowed. So uh, can I just, yeah. The, we're going to move on in a second if specifically questions to officers so if, if it's if there's a if there's a way in which you want to couch it to the to the speaker well, that, that's why i'm going to yeah you, so we, you can that's that's, that's what i'm going to so yeah. if it was officers first i would ask them how standard are these sort of hours but as it's obviously liam here um it's the saturday morning the nine till one o'clock working if the development was to be approved how much do you think you because obviously in my sort of Thought, I just think well, Barrett, they'll come in the week, and then they'll have the weekends off like everyone else. Um, it's it's a very good, very good question. Um, and in brutal honesty, I, I, I don't know how much work would take place on a Saturday. It, it tends to be, um, it, it tends to be sort of finishing off jobs or site clearing jobs or, or cleaning jobs, I believe, rather than any sort of digging of foundations or anything like that. That would take place during the week. Um, but in terms of in terms of the exact specification of what work would would happen on Saturday, I, I don't have that information to be honest. That but that's that is a pretty standard condition, and we generally have working hours on the Saturday. But generally, our part of working is is during the working week. So I think it just that Saturday working like it gives that flexibility to, like I say, carry out the cleaning jobs and the, and the menial jobs if you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands, so uh, thank you very much for your time uh, this evening, Mr Tate, and uh, if you could withdraw to the, uh, very grandly calling it the public gallery, really it's the seats just behind where you're sitting, but uh, thank you, thank you very much. So um, we now move to um, questions for officers on anything that you might have heard there, any specific details within the report. Um, Helen Vegero is uh, joining us at the table as well from uh, the highways team. So if there's any specifics around that, um, we hopefully are, are in a position to be able to answer them. Um, I'm going to go straight to Councillor Merrick because you were starting to ask a question which I um, said you needed to wait till now. I don't know if you if you still wish to answer that, uh, ask that question and then I'll just look for hands for anybody else as, as they're indicating. Uh, the first question is, is regarding uh, policy SS1. 
that there is a listing in the uh, forward planning team of the status of a number of the policies and what weightings can be attached. Uh, can I ask what weighting uh, should be attached to SS1? Can be attached, should I say? Um, so policy yeah, that's that's one. Um, it does align with the um, the general aim of the MPPF. So uh, whilst they don't for planning don't state, um, we'd consider it to have moderate weight. Yeah. Okay. The modified uh, the modifications that were agreed by the council are uh, in the uh, spring this year at the uh, hearings. Um, there is a new uh, section in there which requires the delivery of at least 45% of the 9,396 affordable dwellings that are needed to meet the needs of residents unable to compete on the open market. That clearly requires us to achieve more than the 30% minimum uh, on uh, these types of sites. How has that been taken into account in the negotiations on this site? Um, the MPPF um, only requires 30% affordable housing, so that's what was requested in this case. Yes, that, that wasn't the question. You accepted a modification to the plan, which in effect sets a higher, a higher target for the council to achieve. And it requires achieving more than the minimums on a number of sites if you are to achieve that. So how is that being taken into account in the negotiations? Can you just yeah. clarify which where you're getting that, where you're specifically referring to that from? Because I'm not I'm not clear what you policy SS1. It was the uh, amendment to that which adds an additional sentence to deliver at least 45% of the 9,396 affordable dwellings that are needed to meet the needs of residents unable to compete on the open market. Chair, I'm not familiar with the policy. I'm just wondering, though, whether that means that, that equates to more than the 30% per side. I don't... <laughs> Um, I, is the policy uh, the the aspiration is to? Sorry, Councillor Mayor, have, have you got the wording printed there that you're reading from? Uh, I wrote it down from ah, okay. uh, look, looking at the uh, local plan modifications document before I came to the meeting. Uh, in which case, we might just yeah, need to look at and, and, and just and just clarify yeah, specifically. Sure just hang by yeah. for one minute. If, if you remember at the local plan inquiry, the indication was that the local plan would do, only deliver, I think it was 35% of the requirement. But under the representations that were made, the council agreed to modify the plan to set a specific overall target of 45%. And that clearly requires you to meet above the minimum in at least a proportion of the applications to achieve it. Becky, well, whilst, sorry, Chair, whilst Becky is looking, I, I would just comment, if I may, that um, until the local plan is adopted, um, planning applications have to be determined in accordance with planning policy in the national planning policy framework. Um, and so the applications need to accord with the framework policies at this time, not local plan policies, although, of course, local plan policies are a material consideration. Yeah, that's that's helpful um uh input there sandra and so I, I guess um that's something that members will need to consider when we're into deliberations in terms of um weight that's applied to i suppose any local plan policy in in relation to the mppf at the current stage and we'll just wait on um uh, officers just uh, giving a, a formal response to you 
Okay, in which case, um, so whilst Becky's looking up the detail of that, Councillor Merritt, um, she will come back to you with an answer before we move on from the section, but I will just move us on to um, another question. Uh, I saw Councillor Ayres' hand next, and I've just seen a couple of hands go up. Down. If you could just pop your hands back up again, and I'll note you down. Thank you. Oh, right, keep your hands up till I've looked at you. But Councillor Ayres, on, on you go. I have four, I think they're relatively quick. I'm happy to take them all together or mix them up whichever you want, Chair. So the first one, I suppose, was asking the sort of the same question that Councillor Merritt asked to the applicant, but to officers. Was the answer in terms of the reduction in numbers being to do with the viability of the site? Is that accurate? Are we happy that that is the reason? Thanks. Sorry, Councillor. Uh, you, I've gone. Yeah, um, yeah the, the reason that the agent gave, it, it was to sort of get decent afford, uh uh, decent uh, amenity space, private and public, and just get the separation distances. Uh, and similarly, on the questions that were asked of the applicant, the percentage of affordable, so is that 60% of those will be only the two beds, there's very limited in terms of the four bed. Are our offices happy that that is the correct mix in terms of the affordable and we're not oversupplying two bed affordable and under supplying affordable family homes? Um, that mix was agreed um, following discussions with the housing team. They're satisfied with that mix. Okay. Uh, yeah. In terms of the reference by the Cottonfoot Parish Council to the neighbourhood plan and the neighbourhood plan having only 60 homes in, I was of the belief that the neighbourhood plan had to be compliant to its parent plan. So it couldn't have a different figure into either the local plan or be in conflict to the NPPF. So if the local plan was adopted, then the neighbourhood plan would have to be amended to reflect the local plan figure. Possibly, but I mean, uh, at the moment we have the, um, the Cotman Thorpe neighbourhood plan hasn't gone through all the processes, so it's not adopted and doesn't carry carries very limited weight, but if any. In all of the neighbourhood plans that we've had, where neighbourhood plans have been in conflict with the local plan, they've had to be amended to sit in line with the local plan. So if the local plan is adopted at 92, it's my understanding that the Cottmanthorpe Parish Plan would have to have the same figure in. I suppose it depends on if there's um, what we do with this application, because if it's got a permission in place, that may then reflect differently on what the neighbourhood neighbourhood plan would then say it's all on a at that point in time basis it may it may change to be reflective of what's got permission sandra do you want to just add something further i think generally speaking as a matter of law i think that the um neighborhood plan needs to accord with strategic policies in the local plan and just just to add i think in terms of the weight at, at the moment attached that may be attached to the neighborhood plan i understand it is not at even what is called the regulation 14 stage, which is the first stage at which you can start to attract weight. I understand at the moment there's been an area designation and there has been some informal local consultation and that's as far as it's got. And the last one really quickly, if I can speak through, is the on the update on the changes to the section 106, that's quite a substantial shift from 150,000 down to 47,000. I wasn't aware of any changes in the plans. So is that an error on behalf of us in terms of asking for £110,000 or has £110,000 worth of amenity and play appeared on the plans since this report was written? What's that for? It's because it's on, because we, that was the on-site provision that we then look to actually they are providing quite a lot of open space on-site. You'd see it. Right. The, so when they first started this application of many years ago, there wasn't that amount of open space on site. And that's when that request would have come. Since then, there's been a massive stock change and we've got the open space on site. So we don't think it's reasonable to ask for that amount of money whilst also having provision on site. That's why we've revised it. I've got, I think we're nearly at an answer for you. Let, let, one other minute. Yeah. yeah. If we just, yeah. So that's a, what in essence you're saying is that there is considerably more open space and play space than there was when our leisure team were asked to request it. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, so I think in simple terms, if the initial application came in at 90 odd houses and a request was put forward for an amount and it's now been reduced to 75 houses, 
then the request is reduced or is, is amended accordingly. Uh, next person's hand, I saw, oh, did you want to, you, right, let's go back to Councillor Merritt uh, just to answer this point. Sorry, right, so the SS1 says development during the plan period 2017 to, 2000, to 2032, so that's the context of it, and it said deliver at least 45%, so that wants at least 45% of the affordable housing delivered within that period. The affordable housing condition, H10, hasn't changed, and that still requires the 30% on these sites, so that's why we've asked for 30%. That makes sense? No? Excellent. <laughs> No, it, no, the SS1 is that we're going to deliver 45% of the total 9,396 within that plan period. That's not about saying that sites have got to achieve 45% on site. That's what H10's for. So you can't, if, if you can't is, ask for above what is in H10, and in H10 is 30%. But what he is saying... We're going to deliver 45% through the plan period of the affordable dwellings that are needed. So I think if I'm understanding Councillor Merritt's point correctly, I yep. think his argument is that if the um, policy says that we have to deliver 45% of the total amount within a fixed mm -hmm. period, if we only have a certain number of applications coming through during that period, in order to meet that 45% overall, mm -hmm. we would have to request a higher amount in those applications that were coming forward. So if you have the, the site level app policy, which mm -hmm. is H10, I think yeah, you said, H10. which requires 30%, mm -hmm. but sitting oh, above so that- A minimum of 30%. A minimum of 30%. Sitting above that is a policy that says, we have to deliver 45% of our total need for affordable housing within this fixed period. And therefore, if we only have a limited number of applications coming forward during that fixed period, in order to meet the 45% threshold, we would require a higher than because it's two different think, numbers the, that you're the looking at. Period, the plan, as an closing the name, plans for delivery of housing during that period, and they've worked out of the local plan team that they think they can deliver forty five percent of that during that plan period if it's built out as the evidence suggests. So we've already had, however, nearly nine hundred houses at Monks Cross which you then got 30% affordable housing on that. You've got 30% affordable housing on this. We've had other sites come forward where you've got 30%. That's all been worked out because we've worked out the timings of when we think sites are going to come forward, how long is it going to take? And given that, that's where we've got the 45% from. Okay, I think that it then becomes a bit of a matter of judgment for committee and when we get to deliberations, if we want to consider it and think about it, think about what weight we want to add to that, I'm sure that you'll both chip in if people are going off in directions that they don't think is appropriate. But I think it's, you've asked a question, you've given an answer. Committee members then have to consider whether or not we're satisfied and how we want to apportion weight to the answers that, that have been given. Um, I next had on my list, Councillor Fenton, followed by Councillor Stewart, followed by Councillor Melly, and I can now see Councillor Nelson, but I think possibly Councillor Nelson, you're asking something on this specific point. Um, I will allow you to, but what I don't want to do is spend an awful lot of time when it becomes something that we just have to make a judgment on. So if it's a point of clarification. It's a very quick thing. <laughs> yeah. um, if it says a minimum of 30%, and I'd imagine this doesn't hold a lot of weight, but um, my reading of the papers was that 22.5 houses would have been 30%, which technically means that 23 houses would be a minimum of 30%, but... It, they, there's a contribution as well that makes it up to the 30%. Right. Thanks, you the somewhere that, because you can't get half a house, yeah. we then ask for the contribution for the rest of the half house we can then use. That's absolutely fine, thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, I think it's probably for Sandra. It's I'm assuming that our powers as a planning authority, as we fail to achieve the 45%, will be stronger in terms of insisting for higher levels than they are at the early end of the plan. But that, I'm guessing what we're saying is that we would struggle to push for 45 now because the applicant could argue, well, you've got 25 years to achieve that. As we get through and we're failing to deliver 45%, 
say in five years' time, we'd, have, we'd be in a stronger position to say, no, go away and provide 50. Is, is that the case? It, it, I, I suspect, and I, I, I get the point you're making, I think probably within all of this, we'll be in a much stronger position when we have a local plan that's adopted and actually all of these policies will carry more significant weight than they, than they currently do now. I think for the purposes of this meeting, it is going to be a, a, a judgment call for this committee as to how much weight they feel they want to apply or not to these policies and up to officers to make sure that what we're deciding is robust. Um, if you want to add any further comment. Well, you, well just if, in case it assists, I, I think that the planning officer said earlier that the NPPF asks for 30 percent. Did you say that? So just reminder, Chair, that at the moment it's the NPPF policy that we need to apply. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. Perhaps in a less succinct way, that was sort of the point I was trying, I was, I was trying to make. Councillor Merritt, I will allow you as a point of clarification, but I don't want to, we have an opportunity to debate all of the finer points amongst ourselves as a committee coming forward. As I say, it's, it's some years since I've last been on, been on, so I do need to understand some of the uh, framework. The, the solicitor referred to um, the moderate weight that the local draft local plan policy uh, has. Can I understand what moderate weight actually means in practice? Because the implication of the other comment was because the MPF says uh, 30, that actually moderate main weight means nothing. And that, that wasn't my understanding of what moderate weight previously uh, meant. Uh, Chair, I think it was Becky who said moderate weight. Um, so um, not me, um, but. No, no, it's fine to understanding than I do about the well, book. It's it, well, you have to look at the level of objection that we've got. So you tend to, in planning terms, we tend to go limited weight, moderate weight, full weight, really. The, or substantial, sorry, I missed substantial, and then full weight. Full weight is when you're adopted. Um, limited weight is probably when we're starting off in the process. This is very generalised. Please do that. I'm <laughs> and then your moderate weight is we've got that we're quite far down the road but there are still objections substantial weight is potentially for, towards the ones where there's no objections we're nearly there where and then full weight is when we've adopted it so you need to give it weight and you need it's a, it's a consideration it's just the level of weight that we give it as part of the development management process i think my my steer as chair on this would be that the nppf is the the sort of backstop for us at this moment in time and if we were to apply full weight to a local plan issue and refuse which would be essentially what we would be talking about doing if we were because we can't we are just assessing the, the application as it is before us um, and the refusal grounds was at odds with something that was the backstop within the NPPF then we would be vulnerable to challenge on it um, there's certain amounts of aspiration, I think, when you start setting minimum thresholds, and, and I'm sure that, you know, people will choose when they wish to exceed those minimum levels and when they wish to stick to exactly those minimum levels. Um, it's for us as a committee to decide how much weight overall we want to apply to any of these policies and, and come to our determination at that point. Yeah. But I th I'm sure that officers will be um, anxious if we're applying too much weight and will let us know if we're applying too much weight within the consideration because the most important thing is that we're robust in our decision making. So we will have ample opportunity to debate that when we get to that section. Um, I'm going to move us on now to Councillor Fenton. Thank you Chair. Um, just on section 106 contribution, so the, the proposed <clears throat> condition, I think it's on page 45, has it makes mention of uh, a contribution for a TRO for off-site work. Um, but looking at the suggested Section 106 um, measures that the highways team suggested, the, the final one on page 14 at the top, says off-site highway improvements, provision of tactile crossings for the pedestrian route between the site and the village, and also a crossing point for cyclists. Um, but I can't see those explicitly listed in the proposed list of uh, section 106 conditions so i wondered whether they had been 
uh, <clears throat> considered but hadn't <clears throat> been um, incorporated into the um, proposed Section 106 list of things. I just wondered if I could get clarification on that, please. Um, we can put that as an additional condition that the off-site highway works. I think that's just been admission. Apologies. So if that's an omission, um, I think when we come to final determination, if we can just make sure that that, if, if when we test the officer recommendation, that that condition is included within that. Uh, councillor, I had Councillor Stewart next, I think. Uh, I'm trying to keep a, a, a tab on hands, but if I'm skipping past people that think that they, I should be calling them, do just give me a wave and I will bring you all in. But Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Um, two questions if I can. So on page 29, 5.13, it refers to the site being about half a kilometre from a high frequency bus stop. Is there a particular definition of high frequency? Because you know that's a stop that um, the Parish Council flag doesn't have Sunday service and stops at six o'clock. Um, and probably like a lot of uh, buses, you wouldn't, you know, say it's always to be relied upon. It's the first question. Um, we usually look at frequency in terms of weekdays. That's um, what the guidance tells us to do. Obviously, I'm aware that Sunday and probably Saturday and evenings are reduced, but yes, it would be weekdays normally. Right. Sorry, so, so is there a definition of high frequency? What's what is that definition? Um, it's not, there's not such thing as a clear definition as guidance on bus services and frequency. Um, in more rural areas, uh, a 30 minute um, bus service would be considered frequent, whereas in city centre areas, it'd be 10 to 15 minutes. So it really depends on the context of the site. Okay, because okay, it's not what I would view as high frequency. I mean, even if you differentiate between urban and rural and, and obviously I appreciate those areas it's a lot less frequent um, and the second question is just on the the actual road itself as I understand it there's, there's no money proposed to be spent on the road um, and if you look at page 72 it's got the picture of you know Moor Lane itself and I, I do think it looks incredibly good on this picture and it looks even better on the um, on the screen in in colour but I just don't think it's that good a road. Um, I think it, it feels like it, although you've got house on one side all the way up on the left, and then you've got house on the other side, except for the graveyard. To me, it does feel like a road that is fizzling out. And, you know, they've done very well just to get the sort of couple of vehicles on it. It's always got a lot more vehicles. So my question related to that is, you know, there's, for example, 40,000 proposed to go towards Ascombe Bog, resurfacing the car park and that that seemed a lot of money to me given that you only get a developer contribution on a new house but if that was to come pro rata from every house in Cotton thought that'd be two million and then you think about people coming from Dringhouse and Woodthorpe you know that Ascombe Bog car park would effectively get millions and millions and, and it seems strange to me that nothing as I understand it's going to go on the road itself yes on the you know the pavement essentially so was any thought given to some of the money going to improve the actual road itself? Um, it, the, the road is an adopted highway, so it's the responsibility of the council to maintain it. Um, so it would not be feasible to ask a developer to um, improve a road when the issue is really maintenance by the council um, due to limited resources and budget, obviously. Um, so no, it, this, this was not asked of the developer because it wouldn't be seen as reasonable. It is our duty to maintain the road. Okay, so all right, so we just so we can't because obviously there's health provision, there's education provision, and and they're funded by the taxpayer, like the roads. So is, is the road something we just can't ask for that? Or? We we can ask for improvements linked to the development. So in this case, um, we've got we need some more drop curves and tactile crossings, but we wouldn't be able to ask a developer to maintain a road when the issue is that we have not maintained it. Obviously, this is all in line with our asset management policy, so we wouldn't have prioritised this maintenance, but this is for the council to maintain. Right, so, so sorry, just to be clear, so on this, you're saying that we couldn't have asked the developer as part of facilitating more houses to contribute to a better 
road quality. We couldn't have asked them that. I, I think if I can reframe your question slightly, because I, I, I can understand what you're getting at, and I think I can understand what, what Helen is, is trying to suggest. I think, would it be correct that if, for example, the access route was a, an, a you know, single carriageway or an inappropriate access route, then you could potentially ask for an improved access route. But once there is what is effectively a, a double carriageway, you know, appropriate width carriageway access route, the condition of that isn't something that you could ask the developer to update. But if, it, if the width of the highway wasn't deemed appropriate, you could potentially, as part of the mitigation, ask for that. And I, I think what I'm understanding is that the judgment of the highways department is that, technically speaking, the width of the carriageway is appropriate for the development. There are some other things that they believe are required which are asked for, but the poor condition of the surface of the road is not something that would be an appropriate ask on behalf of the council or, or the planning authority to the developer. Have I summarised your question and your answer correctly? You have, yeah, just cut out the middleman in future and you could do <laughs> questions. Well, that's what I'm here, yeah. hopefully. So. Okay. Uh, the next uh, person I had on my list is Councillor Melly. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, while, we've, while we've got the plans up, um, would you mind just pointing out where the Cotman Thorpe Moor Lane Field site of importance for nature conservation is, please? I'm just not super familiar with the area. So it's not immediately adjacent to the site. Okay, thanks. Just for the benefit of people at home, because uh, you didn't have your microphone on, it's... Sorry. It's a field or two to the west of the site. <coughs> right. oh, no. Yeah, so it, it's still off that plan. And do you have a further question? A completely different question, if that's all right. Thanks. Um, it was a question about off-site sports provision, because there isn't sports provision provided on site for the needs of the residents. But then in the report, um, it says that the ward and the connecting wards have a shortfall in outdoor sports provision. So I was just wondering where the Section 106 money was going to go to and if it's actually going to be possible to meet the needs of the residents of this development. Right, so um, there is going to be um, an off-site uh, sports provision. That's the updated figure in the um, update, which is uh, 47,500. Um, the intended um, uh, clubs would be the Cotman Thorpe Rep Recreation Centre and the Bishop Thorpe Football Club, um, the Ashfield Pitches site. That's what's the intended recipients. So they all, they're all near, nearby enough to the site to be accessed in a sustainable way and actually used by the residents of this development? Uh, certainly the Cotman Thorpe Recreation Centre is, um, the Bishop Thorpe Football Club is the village to the east. The, the Bishop Thorpe Football Club um, trains and plays at Ascam. Um, bar oh, the park and ride site, uh, so actually okay. you can cycle. Walk is maybe a bit of a distance, but cycle would be possible. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Merritt, I've got your hand. I did before on my list have Councillor Nelson, but I think it was because of the question that you asked already. So, Councillor Merritt, yes, uh, can I ask about the um, tr uh, transport uh, related issues? The um, Paragraph 3.43 refers to the DFE guidance about the policy basis for requests towards transport costs and mentions there's no safe walking route within the statutory maximum walking distance to a secondary school. Can I ask about cycling? Because uh, obviously you can tend to be able to cycle a, a further distance than in walking. Um, uh, has the route to Millsorp been looked at in terms of secondary, in fact, both the local primary and the uh, secondary, looked at in cycling terms? And um, are there any improvements that are required on it to make it LTN uh, compliant? So paragraph 3.43 is only about school transport. 
Uh, so right. the school transport criteria is only on walking. Yeah. In terms of cycling routes, there's obviously an existing cycling route with the park and ride site. Um, yeah. And um, it would it was we, we did consider whether other improvements could be conditioned or secured for section 106, but the site being relatively small, we didn't feel that was enough of an impact to justify asking for more contributions yeah. on cycling. Yeah. Can I also ask in terms of the individual properties, do they all have secure covered parking? Because it was a reference to the being in gardens. Is it actually uh, covered and secure? Cycle parking. Yes. Again, yeah. So some of them have garages where cycle parking will be um, provided in, in the garages. Um, and the others have, um, the proposal is a, a garden shed that's big enough to fit the cyclist, cycling. And then there's a condition that we will approve the detail of that. Um, so we'll see the size. And... Yeah, thank you. Okay, any further questions from members? Councillor Nelson. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if you could talk us through, I know that it's detailed quite well in here actually, but just talk us through um, the green belt kind of discussion and the, the thinking that you went through to arrive at the um, kind of position that you're at now in terms of obviously the, the green belt holds incredible weight in the MPPF, but this is at the same time an allocation for housing within the local plan, which also holds weight. Um, I just think it, I would find it quite helpful to just kind of yeah know a little bit of the conversations you went to to get to your weighting with those two things, please. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. No, no. I'll... <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we if you look at the assessment of very special circumstances, page thirty nine to. Okay. Um. Go for it. Well, it is. It's all the way from page thirty nine to forty three, and what we've done is we've outlined that it is inappropriate development because it's class clusters in the green belt. So then you need, this is what we tell you all the time, you need the weight against the very special circumstances and how you do it. So what we've looked at is set out clearly in here in terms of the fact that it's allocated in the emerging plan um, and it's considered to be sustainable and deliverable. So we've gone through a whole process of looking at sites in vigorous detail, trust me, about whether or not this site is acceptable and we can be delivered. So you've got we've got to take that into account. It's a sustain, sustainable, deliverable site. Another notch on your very whether or not you weight. Um, it's on the edge of an existing settlement, sustainably located. Again, sustainable, suitable, deliverable in the weight of everything that you've got to give. We've got an unmet housing need. We need affordable housing as well, in terms of that. It's yeah, it, it, we, it's way enough. All that need against the harm, the fact that we've gone through a really rigorous process to say that actually this should be taken out of the green belt. We've sat down and gone, actually, we're gonna we're okay with these. We consider that these are very special circumstances, and we've made the balance of judgment at this point in time. We're okay with it, subject to, and this is really important, U106 and all the mitigation measures that are required in terms of that, everything that we're going to secure in terms of the affordable housing, the NHS provision, everything else that goes with it, you've got to look at it in a round of things. And that's how we've made the judgment. Does that help? That was a real whistle stop. And if you read that in dip full, because it gives you much more, but that's a whistle stop of what I think you wanted. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, I've not got any further hands. Oh, I have. Uh, Councillor Melly. Sorry, Chair. You seemed so hopeful. Um, I had a question about condition three, about um, proposed materials um, needing approval. And it, I saw in brackets it says including hard surfacing. And I assume that's been deliberately added because of some um, comments from a consultee about um, not all of the hard surfaces all being tarmac adam, the roads and the driveways and everything being the same material. But I was just wondering um, if the plans are approved as submitted, and that includes Tarmacadam for everything, then can that be later not approved under this condition? Is, is the approval of final approval of specific materials just to do with kind of quality, or can it also include things like appearance? So, right at the beginning of the 
condition it says notwithstanding any proposed material specified on the approved drawings so that means notwithstanding what it says on the approved drawings we still want them submitted to us to make sure that we're happy with them and that concludes <laughs> things like appear yeah appearance beyond just quality yeah I got you what? Sorry, I missed that. I'm from a Yorkshire, you what? Pardon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, yeah, I'm just want to be sure that that doesn't mean that materials can be submitted which do fit with the plans. That then it specifically it does give the power it, to. Yeah, it says not withstanding any proposed materials, and it says including hard surfacing on it. Thanks. So that's if we put notwithstanding, it means not what it shows on the plan. We want some. We want more more detail, and we're not tied to the plan. So even though there's another condition that says it will be developed in accordance with these plans, it's then yes. okay within a future condition to say there's not with even though we approved it in those yeah. plans and said you have to meet those because it's specifically we can vary the plans. I know we like to confuse you. <laughs> <laughs> Notwithstand any proposed materials specified on the approved drawings. Okay, thank you. That's our caveat to get away from that. Because I had a similar question about um water foul and surface water drainage and that being in approved plans as being combined, but then another condition saying they have to be. Separate, but it's the same answer, I assume. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I just have one question that I just want to pick up from the um, public speaker um, from the parish council who was raising some concerns about the access at the top of Moor Lane where it joins Main Street and uh, the safety of that junction. And I just wondered if you could just talk us through um, what assessment's been done in terms of volume of uh, increased volume of traffic and, and any safety requirements as a result of that. So the applicant provided a transport assessment, which we reviewed, um, that included a review of collision data. Um, and there, there are no collisions recorded at that junction. Um, so that would mean that it would be quite difficult to justify asking for improvements because I know it sounds a bit counterproductive to wait for a collision, but at the same time, if there's no evidence of danger, then it's really difficult to ask for improvements. Um, so what we looked at, however, is the speed limit potentially, and obviously there's a TRO um, in, in the section 106 as a contribution towards a traffic regulation order, which could in, include 20 mile per hour, and we'd have to look at the extent of that speed limit. Obviously, that would follow the traffic regulation process, so that would be in consultation with residents and the parish council, etc. But that we've, we've made sure we secure this money so that we can look at speed limit changes. So um, just to be completely clear, and I'll, I'll come to you in a second, Councillor Stewart, um, if there was an assessment that something needed to happen with that junction for safety reasons, um, the sort of the civils, the, you know, the, the, the infrastructure, the, the, the changing of any of the layout of the junction, that sort of thing, would be something that the council would deal with. Um, if, for example, it needed, I, I, I don't honestly know whether there's double yellow lines at the moment or, you know, those sorts of things, those sorts of things would have to have a traffic regulation order and there's a contribution towards that traffic regulation order that might be required to make that junction as safe as you think is appropriate based on any increase in traffic. So the, the transport assessment included a modelling of the junction to make sure that it could function with the extra traffic and that showed that there was no impact. Um, obviously I know in practice we will see more vehicles but what we're looking for is significant or unacceptable impact not just more traffic. Um, so that's why we can't um, request any changes, physical changes in terms of um, junction layout um, but the TRO could cost. So there's already double yellow lines to protect um, the immediate um, um, junction but we could look at further double yellow lines or a change to speed limit. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Stewart, did you want to just... It was just on the point, just to clarify, it's not really the junction with Main Street, that, that becomes Main Street, but I think the speaker is talking about the junction with Station Road, which is the road off to the right from Moor Lane or to the left from Main Street, basically, I think. Yeah. yeah apologies, I, I did drive up to the site and I know the junction, I just don't know the names of the, of the bits of the road, so apologies for that. Okay, uh, I think that brings us to the end of uh, questions for uh, officers, um, which uh, brings us then into the debate part of uh, this meeting. So 
Um, I'll just remind you that the, the protocol is that the first thing when we come to thinking about the actual determination is that we test the officer recommendation. So I'm not looking for proposals for anything at the moment. It is just an opportunity for uh, members to, to give their views, um, give an indication perhaps of where they, they feel on it, perhaps test out some of the different weightings, some of the things that we've heard and, and where people feel. So it is very much over to yourselves um, to uh, you know, give give comment, give thoughts, and uh, I'll then come to asking for any proposals of, um, you know, which way we want to go on it. So, uh, looking for hands. Oh, come on, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Fisher, I'll go to you, and then Councillor Nelson. Thank you. Um, this is this is a greenbelt site. It's therefore it is inappropriate development by definition. What we have to look at are the mitigating factors that could, at the very special circumstances. The main one is we don't have a five-year housing supply, which we know about. That is obviously a factor. It's not a definitive factor. We don't have to approve this site because of that, but it is something we should take into account. Looking at the site, um, I feel it's in a reasonably sustainable location. I don't think it's way out in the countryside. It's not so far from the public amenities. Um, I agree that the bus service from Cottonthorpe is pretty pathetic, and that's a matter that needs to be dealt with elsewhere. Uh, the fact that you can't get buses on a Sunday or from late in the evening from a main village without walking a long way is, is regrettable. However, the standard of Moor Lane, the Moor Lane is actually of a perfectly decent size. It's perfectly suitable for two-way traffic. There is no issue um, with that. Um, the, the surface does need some attention. Perhaps this housing development being produced may push it further up the list towards getting some proper maintenance, which I think it needs. Um, the site is not contrary to nature conservation. It's um, it's a fairly boring field, to be quite honest. When I had a look at it, it wasn't anything very exciting. Um, on balance, and I, I, I approve green greenbelt sites with extreme reluctance but i think on balance i think i will be supporting this application i think it meets the criteria and furthermore when the local plan is adopted which we hope it will be later next year i think there will be no they could bring it back and it would be virtually a fait accompli so i see no reason to refuse it at this present time so i'll, I'll support um approval thank you uh councillor nelson i had you next thank you um I think I wanted to say, you know, many very similar things, really. Uh, I think it's really positive to see how the developer has worked with our council officers. And I was really pleased with some of those answers around, you know, why has why have certain things in the site been done in a certain way? Well, because this is what, you know, York City Council's housing officers said, or because this is what the ecology, you know, team have recommended. Um, and with that being the case, uh, with the fact that it fits so clearly into the kind of local plan that is not quite yet published. Um, and within the framework, I think, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I would be happy to support this application. OK, I've got Councillor Stewart next and then Councillor Fenton. Do you want to touch on the, on the local plan aspect? Because obviously, as um, Becky said, there are quite a few pages about how it is green belt, but there's very special circumstances which about the state of local plan. Um, and I think we've got to be a bit careful with sort of thinking that because it's in the, the local plan and it, it is a site approved in the neighbourhood plan that's emerging, but for fewer numbers, um, about it then having that next step. So, well, it's in the local plan. And on this sort of thing being approved, and of course, in Cotman Thought, we've already seen a site approved on broadly the same basis in, um, in, in the local plan at the other end of the village. Um, I think the council is just potentially opening itself up for a bit of a free for all of all of the sites in the local plan should meet certain criteria. They should all be um, sustainable. You know, there aren't any that are particularly out on a, a limb. And therefore, as the local plan emerges, um, are we not just going to have them all done on day one or in the in the weeks before? I can see Councillor Air nodding his pen in an agreement. Not a uh, Councillor, I will have his uh, opportunity to speak in a moment. I, I've got yeah. Councillor Fenton uh, was next. I think just on the <clears throat> the point that's been raised about the the density of the site and how um, 
more homes could have been um, could have been accommodated on the site. Um, I think the balance that's been struck in terms of um, ensuring a, a there is a degree of open space on the site. I think is um, will make the 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 new estate a better uh, better and hopefully more pleasant place for the for the occupants to live. I, I don't underestimate the importance of a kind of place making <clears throat> um, and think that the uh, having 60 on the site which which is sort of the stated preference of the um the parish council would 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 take the density even further away from the um from the sort of the the, the sort of the benchmark threshold that that um has been mentioned so i think it i think it is um a sustainable development uh, i think special circumstances um, do exist and, and, and I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. I'm not entirely sure how I can do puppetry with a pen, but if I was to do so, it would have been nodding at well, Councillor well, Nelson well, well, well. and shaking his head against Councillor Stewart. I think totally agree with what Councillor Nelson said. I think what's refreshing about this is it's an early indication of how much smoother planning will be once a local plan is adopted. There has been that cooperative, cooperative process. We've had those discussions, the right decisions seem to have been achieved. I take Councillor Merritt's point in terms of the 45%. I've actually had a look at that policy and it's, it is quite interesting. It'd be interesting to see how that pans out in reality. What that commits us to doing is delivering 45% of our affordable total. It's not 45% of all housing, it's 45% of the affordable need of which there is a roundabout in the plan period and nine, I think a 905 shortfall. So I just did some quick calculations about how that would sort of apply. I think, well, first of all, what we'd have to do is is subject to annual review, so it would be for the executive, I believe, to look at that on an annual basis and say, well, actually, we're not hitting the numbers that we need to hit. That triggers that review, then triggers action. And for this site, interestingly, I think, so I started looking at that and saying, what would that shortfall mean on particular sites and percentage of housing delivery? So you would hope this would be about 7% of the annual housing target being delivered. So if it was picking up that shortfall, there's the possibility you might get an extra four affordable homes on this site to make the case that that was necessary and robust enough to the review process to say, actually, yeah, we're not hitting our targets. Therefore, we can legitimately ask you to provide an extra well, 3.92 as we, we get through into those circumstances. So I think, again, contrary council Stewart, this is precisely the opposite of a free-for-all. This is why we're not having a free-for-all. We're having specific sites. There is, you, you contribute. Free-for-all of the local plan type. Well, no, you, you contribute. You, in fact, you submitted quite a bit of the local plan, council Stewart, and you'll be aware there is a phasing strategy as part of that one. And those are the discussions that happen with developers and certain things will not be able to come through. Certain things will come through. This is one of those sites that was earmarked to come through in years one to five. Other sites will take considerably longer and will be five to 10, 10 to 15. That's the process of a local plan and how you start to deliver and capacity things. So I think the general summary of those comments is that I will probably be supporting this application, council of closure. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any further contributions or comments? I, I haven't got any further hands at the moment, no. Um, I'm just gonna make a, a quick observation, which is um, that actually, not necessarily specific to this site, but in, in general terms, it's, it's always, in my view, positive to see the affordable housing contribution delivered on site with an appropriate mix. Um, it's really good to see, uh, you know, a good number of affordable sites. We can talk about the specific numbers and, and all the rest of it, but you know, there's a, there's a good number of affordable houses of a varying type um, coming forward with this site. Um, my one observation would be that the policy does say a minimum 30%, and actually, when it gets to 0.5 of a house and that 0.5 gets commuted, it's a pity in a way that it couldn't have been 23 and not 22, because just doing the very minimum is okay the letter of it but it's not the spirit of it when when we're saying a minimum 30 percent um but that's more a general observation than, than anything specific to this so um we've had a number of contributions as i said um we test the officer recommendation first sorry councillor ed oh you're, you're just jumping straight in. uh so i, I just would invite anybody who, who wished to move um and, and noting that the additional um condition um well, I'm, I'm just looking for a proposal in a second, first of all, and then I'll ask you to, to run through um, what the full detail is. So I think Councillor Eyre jumped straight in. Yeah, I was. it was the management fee issue. So I was keen to make sure that any proposal we put forward includes whatever the legal officer said we can possibly include in terms of management fees on affordable homes. That's duly noted. And, and I think everybody is everybody happy with something? I'm seeing lots of nods on that. Yeah. If that's the case, happy to propose officer recommendation. Okay, and I'm going to 
toss you up between Councillor Fenson and Councillor Fisher because I did see his hand first, but yours has gone straight up as well. So who, who's going to? Oh. Councillor Fenson is going to second. Okay, so uh, Becky, if you could run us through. It's based on the conditions in the report and the 106 recommendations in the report, the additional information and the conditions and changes within that. The additional monitoring fee of £14,000, the additional highway works condition that was discussed with Councillor Fenton, and a management fee in term. We look at the management fee in terms of the affordable housing element of the scheme. Okay, uh, in which case, uh, if I can see by show of hands all of those who are in favour of that recommendation, if you could show now. Okay, and anybody against? And any abstention? That is approved then with nine in favour and two abstentions. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just take a short adjournment. Um, I will ask members, it's just coming up to six, so I think if we could just come back at five past six. 10 past, I think 10 past makes it a little bit, five past, you can be back prompt, prompt on 10 past. Thank you.
Right, welcome back everybody to this evening's meeting of Planning, planning Committee A. Uh, we're moving on now to agenda item 4B, which is the Pike Hills Golf Club on Tagcaster Road. Um, so if I can uh, just welcome Eric Matthews to the table, who's the planning officer who's been uh, handling this application. And uh, if I can invite you to uh, just talk us through any updates, first of all, and then we'll go through the plans. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I shall just do the headlines. Uh, in respect to all, the first one is corrections. The missing word from paragraph from paragraph 5.4 is NPPF. I have additional representations from Councillor Anne Hook, who indicated that she wished her previous objection to be maintained. She feels that caution should be the overriding principle and that work should not be undertaken if it gives rise to the slightest possibility of harm to Askham Bog. Following discussions with the applicant, uh, a number of the conditions have been reworded to make them more precise, specifically conditions three, four, five, six, eight, ten. And 14, 16, and 17. In terms of what the alterations are, I shall outline them very briefly. In terms of condition three, The condition as amended requests greater detail in terms of the width and geometry of the access, as that was the principal issue or that, that was outstanding. Condition four, sections uh, showing through the access and road showing materials uh, and the drainage at one to 10. Condition five, it's work that it, it's vehicles that are and deliveries that are construction related. Condition six, uh, it's uh, amending uh, the, the, as, as the stage one road safety audit has already been submitted, allowing for a stage two and stage three road safety audit. Condition eight, uh, it's uh, adjusting the hours of operation uh, as there's a potential for conflict with the requirements of Highways England in terms of peak traffic flows. Condition 10, moving the first requirement for a written scheme of investigation as that has already been undertaken. Condition 14 uh, references the material specification. Condition 16 requires a plan at scale 1 to 500 of the site compound so it can be specifically controlled. And condition 17 is updated to deal with the most recent uh, comments of both the IDB and your own uh, flood, frontline flood risk management authority. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you. Uh, Becky, do you want to add to that? Yeah, we've, we just would like to, it's not on any of the additional information, we'd like to um, amend condition 19. That's with regards to the landscaping scheme. We think that that needs to be um, phased and timetabled in terms of when it's going to come forward. Given that the development's coming forward over phases, we think that the um, landscaping scheme needs to do the same. So we would like to reword that condition. Um, we can get the wording um, out of the meeting to be a chair, be a yeah, be agreed by the chair and vice chair if needed. Do you want me to run through the presentation? If you could, please. Thank you. Okay. So the application is for the redevelopment of Pike Hill Golf Course in yeah, yeah. importation and gradient of soils. So you can see the red line. Well, it's large site as you can see here with the site location plan. So that's the Askham Bog out of area, which is important in terms of the location, the existing fairways and the existing water logging. This is the phase 1A plan. I must admit these are fairly technical drawings, for to, it's just to give context of the size of the phases. Phase 1B, 
and then one C, one D, and you can see, and the earthworks that are going to be involved are significant in terms of this. And that's the landscaping plan. And the next slide, you're not going to be able to see them very well, but they are in your agenda packs. Uh, the cross sections, again, more cross sections, and the surface water management plan. So complex. I'll probably leave it on that one for you in terms of the landscape plan. That's it from us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, as previously, um, if members have any questions about the specifics of the plans that we've just seen, um, if there's any points that um, you want to know in any uh, greater detail, uh, this is this is a point to ask. It's not your only point. If you think of something later, we can always come back. But uh, Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Chair. Just, so just for clar clarification on the map that's on the screen, the areas in red are... Are those the areas that are to be <clears throat> where the, let the the ground level is to be raised? It may be a question for the applicant, but I just wondered if. Yeah. So the areas in red is tree shrub clearance and those green areas are new tree shrub planting. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Eyre. I mean, I've got a million questions about those slides, but it'll give me PTSD from geography, GCSE, but just the easy one is to clarify that the three new holes are the ones at the top. Uh, so yeah, the site at the top left hand uh, section of the plan, that, the new holes go in there. That that is the area of the extension. That's one. That was there. One, yes. Two, two, yes. Yeah. In there. Okay. Any further questions on the specifics of the plans at this time? Nope. Okay, so uh, if I could then move us on to um, public speakers. We've just had um, the uh, agent for the applicant registered to speak, uh, which is Alistair Hoyle. So if you'd like to come to the table, and I know you've also got alongside you Richard Lord, who is available to answer any further questions um, as appropriate. So, uh, Mr Hoyle, you have three minutes to address the committee. I'll give you a heads up when you've got about 30 seconds left. And then if you can just hang tight in case there are questions um, from members afterwards. And if you'd like to start in your own time. Thank you, Chair. And good evening, members. Uh, I'm, I'm Alistair Hoyle. I'm a planning consultant with AXIS, a multidisciplinary planning and environmental consultancy. I am the planning agent for this application. The environmental considerations with this scheme, the detailed assessments undertaken for the application and the views of the technical consultees, all of, all of whom have no objection, are clearly outlined within the committee report. Therefore, I do not wish to repeat those points, but instead say a few words on the need and the benefits of this scheme. Pike Hills is an 18-hole parkland course built around the Askham Nature Reserve. The club was formed in 1904, and has over 800 members and is a treasured local facility. Unfortunately, the golf course, the golf course experiences quite significant flooding in low-lying areas. This can mean that parts of the golf course are unusable for several months throughout the year. And on occasion, the golf course has had to close entirely because it, it is completely unplayable. This is not a sustainable situation for the golf club. For the golf club to survive, the existing member base must be retained and grown and more visitors encouraged to use the golf course. This would only be possible if the current flooding issues are addressed. The golf club is seeking to resolve this drainage issue by raising levels across parts of the site through importation and distribution of subsoil materials and to install an improved drainage scheme. Several other improvements are proposed, including extending the course onto land to the northwest, to provide three new holes, reconfig reconfiguring the existing course to improve its playing features and provide an overall better playing experience and offering greatly improved practice facilities. The design philosophy is to make golf more accessible to all and make it, make it encouraging to play 
The golf club also wishes to create a new golfing landscape that is sympathetic to and in keeping with the existing landscape setting. Several new landscape features have been created as part of the course design, comprising new grassland areas, new native woodland plantations and new ponds, delivering an overall biodiversity net gain. The engineering works involve, involve the redevelopment. The engineering works involved with the redevelopment of the gold course will be carefully undertaken and will be subject to stringent controls. Only uncontaminated materials suitable for restoration will be imported. This project has been developed over a number of years, involving a careful and iterative design process and detailed dialogue with the key stakeholders, including the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, the council's officers, and the Internal Drainage Board. Indeed, I have personally been involved with this scheme for over six years. We kindly request that members support the officer's recommendation and approve this planning application, enabling the significant benefits to be delivered and ensuring the long-term viability of this important local facility. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, I don't know what's happening this evening, but everybody is coming in at absolutely bang on three minutes, which is which is fantastic to see. So uh, thanks thanks for that. So I'm just inviting questions then from members, if you can just stay put, and I can see Councillor Ayer has one. If anybody else wants to just indicate, and I'll keep an Hopefully a straightforward question. As someone who does occasionally ruin a good walk, I was surprised as to why there was an additional three holes when golf courses normally go in multiples of nine. If you could just could you just just make sure you pop your microphone on um so there's just a little button yeah there we go i think that so the course is is going to still maintain its 18 holes so with the addition of the three holes at the top um it's it's leaving room for the rest of the course to be reconfigured um the, the some of the par threes will become par fours par fives um, a lot of the holes down the south side are being realigned for safety purposes because there's a there's a high risk of golf balls going onto the highway, uh, which is a major carriageway. So they're being realigned so that the playability is away from the from the road. Um, obviously, there's the flooding aspects as well, but it just provides more room um, to to provide the, the the more enhanced playing experience, which in turn will attract new members and, and ensure the, the longevity of the club. Okay, Councillor Stewart was next. Thanks. Uh, two questions. Um, I'm no expert at all on soil or anything like that, or that sort of thing. But the amount of soil you bring in, it all seems to be, you know, very high quality. Um, is it the case? I'm thinking of another golf course I know of where they seem to be doing a similar thing about bringing a lot of soil. In. They seem to be, shall we say, bringing lower quality. So in terms of how, you know, it, well, put another way, that there's sort of some lower quality stuff for the lower down and then obviously higher quality is that fair yeah, to say that define doing... what you mean by quality i mean well it, that's it... that's my point, that's my point. <laughs> I, I don't know oh. but but yeah so long... there's, there's there's two aspects of the material there's your geotechnical properties um which which mean that the material um is solid and will hold up can be compacted so in in that respect a low quality material will be will be wouldn't be able to be compacted managed to be wet and that's not the kind of material that we would use um there's some aspects where i you said low quality to me i would picture contamination full of horrible bricks and rubble that isn't the kind of material that we're bringing either so it's it's we use i don't know whether you're familiar with the claire scheme um it's an alternative to an environmental permit and they have a, a, a definition of waste code of conduct which is is almost their sort of specification and requirements for using their scheme and the requirement is to use um, clean, inert and naturally occurring soils only. So they come from local development sites um, and it's, it's usually virgin dug material out the ground. So there's no, there's no um, previously imported made ground or fill or any building rubble or anything like that. Well, that's the sort of thing I was thinking of. Yeah. The, the other case I'm thinking of is definitely using rubble to the point that you know, the person I was talking to had been told um, as a joke by somebody that yeah. the golf course is short of money. They're having to take in other people's rubbish, which is clearly a joke. But obviously, yeah, what doing. It's... so it's meant as a sort of compliment to what you're doing. And uh, the second question is just about the access. Obviously, here, if mm -hmm. this happens, it's all accessible by the 1237. Your access from the A64 is, is obviously not great, particularly on the, on the way out. Was any thought given to improve that? I appreciate that's something in conjunction 
with at, at this at stage, this point or I mean, it's it's we're we're creating um, an entrance on the other side uh, suitable for the delivery of the of the materials. Um, so um, th there is possibly a future option for the golf club to uh, to adopt that entrance if they if they so wish. But at the moment, that's in, in this particular application, it's there for the for the delivery of materials. So there's there's there's, I mean. The entrance, rightly so, from the from the other side, it's quite a. You've got to slow down and then turn um, quite a tight left, haven't you, to get down, and uh, that would be totally unsuitable for heavy goods vehicles. Yeah, I'm just going to make a, just a point of clarity, um, just on that access point from the uh, ring road, which is a temporary access mm. that is conditioned to be removed and restored to what's currently there. So, if at some point down the line there was a decision that that's a preferred access point from the club's point of view there would have to be a, a separate Another application, application process yeah. through so it's not that that temporary access can then stay and it's just just so yeah. everybody's completely clear about yeah. it but you carry on council through yeah thank you no so that wasn't really my question my question was basically in doing this application you're going to have a temporary access and obviously there's costs with that mm -hmm. and then you're going to have a you're going to go back to the a64 as your access for everything else going forward did you think about just saying well, we won't have temporary access on 1237 will use now to improve our access on the A64? Was that part of the thought process? I think it was a consideration from the club, um, but the, the, there was no discussion about potentially upgrading the, the golf club entrance itself. Okay. Uh, next, I had Councillor Merritt, and then I've got Councillor Fisher, and I see Councillor Nelson as well. Obviously, with all these improvements, uh, it may potentially increase the usage of the club. Has has that been considered and what sort of percentage increase might result? It's it's definitely been considered. That's that's the main reason of doing it. I think there's uh, a lot of there's a high percentage of, of older members at the moment and they want to attract um, younger um younger players um obviously for the you know for the longevity of the of the golf club i don't know um exactly what what percentage the golf club of of think that that's going to develop but um you know the we're bringing in quite you know a, a, a brand new driving range is one of the um, or improving the existing driving range is one of the key features um much more um, um professional um playability more um improved holes so it will naturally attract quite a few more um, members, but I don't have, I don't know what the percentage the club had in mind. That's that's something I'd be more than willing to to answer once I've spoken to the club. The figure will be there, but I don't have it to hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Councillor Fisher is next. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a very interesting scheme. Um, it is a very, very big scheme as well. And obviously it is in a very, very, very sensitive location. And clearly in my mind, the critical thing about whether I'm going to vote to approve this is to be absolutely certain that there is no damage to ask and bog, which is a very, very important wildlife site. Um, I've just done a few calculations. You're bringing 350,000 cubic meters of screened soils at an average density for soil, which is about 2.65 tonnes per metre cube. That's about 933,000 tonnes of soil. And, you know, that's clearly going to require some like 20 to 40,000 lorry loads of soil, which obviously is going to be significant in terms of road safety, getting those safely on and off the site. Now, obviously, you're using the A1237, and I gather that you're agreeing that they all have to turn left into the site and turn left out of it, which is really important. You don't, you don't cross yes. the carriageway. The other point about this is this is also going to be incredibly expensive scheme. And it's phased. And my worry is that since a lot of the mitigations are in the later phases, the things that will prevent any damage to ask and bog, are you, I, the condition 13 says that you have to provide legal and um, funding advice that you have got the funding in place for the entire scheme. Can you provide that at this present time? It's on page 107 on condition 13. It says details of the legal and funding and mechanism in place to secure long-term monitoring and management for a period not less than 30 years. Is that definitely in place so we can guarantee that phases one and two, one and one B are not going to be done and then the later phases are not going, are not going to be financially feasible? 
Yeah, no, it's it's, it's funded because it it's, yes, it is funded. Yes. Good. That takes a weight off my mind. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Nelson. Thank you. Um, I'm also thinking along the kind of lines of Councillor Fisher. Really, um, for me, the the big thing here is the input of Yorkshire Wildlife Trust mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, the considerations around Ask and Bog. So I understand they're not objecting to this. And would you say they would they are supportive of this, or would you say they are not objecting to it? They are supportive. I'm, I'm just going to jump I, in sorry, there. is that I'm not, not a, sure it's fair to ask yeah, the agent fine, whether or fair. not somebody else is supporting um, or not? But that, but it is clear that, and I have double checked that there were some objections that initially Yorkshire Water, uh, Yorkshire Water, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust had objected outright, I believe. They then had resolved some of the issues, but there was some outstanding. Um, there is a reference in the report to one outstanding objection. I'm reassured that that has also been resolved now. Um, and I think when we come to officer questions, it might be worth just asking the officers about the contact and, and the interactions they've had with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, but I don't think the agents no. for the applicant. I, I can't, an if I could just say one thing though, we did for, from the outset, the first thing we did was make contact with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and we've worked with them throughout the entire process. That you know, there's been there's there's been you know to and fro in they they proposed some things, we proposed some things, and we've we've come to a, a, an agreement where essentially you know, there's going to be a great scheme there where we're going to enhance biodiversity around the bog and, and do all sorts of things for them. But we've worked tirelessly with them throughout the whole thing and, and they are very happy. And, and my kind of second part to that in many ways is, is there a commitment to continue that step by step throughout the process? Yes. And even sort of uh, perhaps sort of and understanding that if at some point the testing of these materials that are coming in doesn't go you know shows that it is isn't what you expected or there is potential harm i know there are conditions in here that say you know things will be stopped and remediated mm -hmm. um kind of in any situation like that but is there a commitment to that ongoing testing checking and building with a caveat in there that if something is going wrong yes yeah, we've got we've got that two very detailed hard. documents. We've got the imported material specification and the construction environmental management plan, which um, have a, have exactly that in it. There's um, there's there's lots of testing. There's water monitoring, surface water, groundwater. We've we've got two boreholes that were put in uh, at the beginning of the work, so the groundwater will be monitored throughout the scheme. The imported materials will be monitored throughout the scheme. And we've said to the Yorkshire Wildlife just that we will, you know, provide, um, you know, weekly test results to them all the time. They will come onto the site. We can walk them around on a weekly or monthly basis or whenever they want to do. And there will be that ongoing communication with them. And they've had a lot of input into the design as well. For example, uh, we've got a, a, a nine metre standoff from the edge of the bog from the works. Um, we've provided access for the uh, internal drainage board as well for, for the ditch that goes around the bog. So it is all in place and it's in writing in, the, in those documents as well. So it, it will be adhered to. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, in the absence of um, further hands, I'm just gonna ask you one question uh, before I uh, allow you to go. Um, uh, I just wondered if you could give us a, a, um, a sense of Obviously, this um, is a project that's phased over a period of time. I'm not particularly clear from the report what that time frame is. Um, so I think there's there's two or three different phases. Clearly, some aspects have to start first, and others perhaps run. I'm not sure if they're concurrently or whether they they um, you know one has to finish before the next one starts. But I have no sense of whether this is something that takes place over six months, six years, sixty years. Um, if you could just give us a, a it, it will be a continuous scheme, and it's it's probably it's going to be about uh, just under three years, to between two and a half and three years for the for the uh, whole for the, for the, for the, the whole the thing. Whole yeah, the, the first the first phase is the smallest phase, um, and that's where we provide uh, the um, the infiltration basin for the triple SI, and we're creating it's that phase right in the top right hand corner there, and that's probably going to take about two months to complete. The second phase in the field, um, that's uh, about a year's worth. Uh, and then um, the second, the, the other two phases, again, that's about a year and a half for them both. And it, it, it obviously depends on how many um, 
soil deliveries um you know can come to the site as well but um we are anticipating that we should be able to attract the material and and get the get the scheme uh, finished in under three years okay that, that's that's helpful yeah. to, to know and and just um you know just to sort of confirm i mean I, I know there's a number of conditions in here around the way in which the scheme is developed and all of the rest of it my understanding is that in effect for the um sort of mitigations to be brought to fruition for the for the um whether it's benefits to Askenbog or, or at least you know the, the the sort of making sure that there's no problems with Askenbog, it requires all of the phases to be completed in order for that whole system to to work um and i just wondered um you know obviously there is the condition that's in there around you know detailing the funding and, and all of those sorts of things in terms of your fallback were something to go wrong something to be unexpected um you know can we be secure as a, as a committee really that that those mitigations almost whatever happens will be delivered what we don't want to do is have phase one start set a problem that then ask and bog is being impacted on and and suddenly the whole scheme sort of stalls and, and we're left with a with a bit of a mess so anything that you can just give us as a reassurance obviously as i say i know there's the conditions in here but it's just understanding from your point of view what your thinking is in terms of um you know that kind of risk assessment and knowing that you've got the, the suitable things in place to deliver this scheme in full yeah so i think i mean i don't think are you, are you saying that you think that they're, they're all linked so that if we start phase 1a uh, and then don't do the rest of it there's going to be some detriment to the the triple si my reading of the report and i'll, I'll we'll ask clarification from officers mm. when we get to it is is that there are elements of both the impact on the green belt and the mm. impact on ask and bog that require all the phases of the site to be completed in order for the mitigation to be delivered and there's an acknowledgement that there is harm caused which is mitigated over time and so it's just seeking that reassurance not just in terms of us as a committee looking at the conditions that we've got mm. but knowing that you as the as you know the agents for the applicant and the applicant themselves are also considering if something goes wrong and we can't deliver on the whole of the scheme how are we making sure that the mitigations are delivered i suppose so if, if everything remained the same as is now within um for example the field um at the top there there's 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 no death if that field didn't happen the the drainage system that exists currently within the golf course would not be impacted whatsoever um i think the, the field is completely the only part really that's outside of the 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 golf course uh, the rest of the course is made up of a, of a series of drains that come through the link with the perimeter drain around the triple si um i don't think they're linked as much as, as what what you say i think for example the first phase um we're we're creating um a basin to collect surface water from from that phase um but if the rest of the system that feeds the bog would not be impacted if we it would because we you just maintain the status quo. So I, there's, there's no there's no detriment if we if we weren't if we were to just do phase one for example and and, and finish that and create that the, the there's there's no impacts on the rest of the course or anything that's that's happening to the bog it wouldn't make it any worse. I think it is just just worth saying and just just worth clarifying that whilst it's a, a phase development, it's if if you were to approve the application and, and to grant consent, you will be doing so for the entire scheme. And that's the scheme that has to be delivered, and you, as an authority, would have control over the over that. So that's you know, plan. That that's not quite how it works. I don't think in terms of planning, we we can't make sure that you deliver the entire scheme. You can. You, you're absolutely right. We have to look at the entire application, and we can grant permission or not. But once you've started, you've started, and depending on our conditions we have limited and that's why we'll no doubt want to make sure our conditions are tight enough to, to to mitigate and it is it's helpful to hear you saying that you know you you, you believe that each phase is independent yeah. and, and can be sort of done succinctly but it wouldn't be correct to say that we can force the developer or you know yourselves as applicants to complete the entire scheme necessarily so you know that'll be something that i'm sure members will want to test with officers mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Sorry, and I was just trying to clarify that you 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 wouldn't be cons granting consent for a, a phased a phased development. You're granting consent for the for the entire scheme. 
Yeah. So so we 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 do um quite quite a few schemes like this and and we've we've never had uh, an issue before because I, I think obviously you look at the risks of what could end the scheme. So one of the one of the main things is um the attraction of material and that relies on uh, local development schemes where where the soils will come from. Um we um our commercial team have been speaking to quite a lot of of local companies, local businesses at the moment that that have um you know the whole side of things that deliver the materials that are, that are involved with various schemes and and we are very very confident that we can attract the material to deliver into the into the site um we do a lot of um due diligence before you know we've we've spent a, a lot of money just on this planning application alone so we make sure um that that we know the area know that we're going to be able to attract the material um, we've already um, worked in this area quite a bit. We've 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 got a um, a quarry that we've been restoring um, just off the M62. We've done other works at another golf club, club in Headingley. Um, we we do know the area quite well. Um, we work for FCC on a couple of their um, Yorkshire sites as well, doing restoration schemes there. So we do know the you know the area really well. So we are very confident that we can attract the materials to deliver it and you know we've got a healthy business we we've got lots of schemes that we're working on at the moment um from a perspective of you know finances and stuff like that we've, we've no worries that we wouldn't be able to deliver this scheme and you know that's that's the main thing okay thank you that's that's helpful um so i think that that's it in terms of member questions so uh, if you'd like to uh, mm -hmm. it yeah. sounds ever so grand retire to the gallery thank you so <laughs> move, move back a seat or two and uh, and it's over to um, uh, members now if um, you have questions for officers based on uh, things that you've uh, maybe heard and on things that you think from the report. Yep, sure, Becky, if you want to just add. Sorry, before you start, condition three, I don't think it's tight enough. I think we need to amend it before I just in, inevitably this will come up. It talks about the construction access. We need to add further details to that along the lines of and this is just once the proposal has been brought into use the construction access shall be removed and reinstated to its previous condition we hadn't put that on and we should have done so when you come to voting if you decide to go that way i'd ask that you amend it along those lines please sorry before i ask yeah. questions just realize yeah. that we haven't done it thank you duly noted yeah. so uh it's questions from members and i see councillor Merritt first i've got councillor melly on he's looking around the room yeah. Um, first question is on page 88, 3.4. Raise no objection to the proposal subject to any permission being conditioned to require a written scheme of investigation in respect of the golf club extension. I'm sorry, I don't understand what that scheme of investigation is. If someone could explain. Could you just repeat where it was? Sorry, I didn't yeah, get that uh, Page 88, Paris 3.4. Oh, so the archaeologist, archaeological investors, yeah. So the archaeologist has no objections subject yeah, to a condition. I'm sorry, all right. Condition ten. Miss, miss, uh, miss, miss. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, second uh, issue. In, in terms of the highway comment, the highway comment obviously appears to refer to the application. Uh, regarding the temporary access. Uh, given the comments that this redevelopment of the golf course may actually lead to increased usage, what consideration was given by highways to the impact and the and acceptability of the existing awful entrance and exit uh, to accommodate that? I can just invite Ian Stokes from Highways to answer that, please. Yeah, um, Ian Stokes, Principal Development Control Engineer uh, on the planning side. Um, from the Highways perspective, we could only consider the application for the import and export of material and the temporary access for, for the provision of access to the site to bring that material in. Um, it could be considered just speculation that the improvement to the golf course will improve numbers of users and that's out with the scope of what i could consider on the application just as a point of clarity clarity and i'm, I'm 
I don't know if this might be what your thought would be as well, Councillor Merritt. Surely um, intensification of use of a site would be something that highways would consider. So, for example, in the previous application where there's a number of dwellings being put on, that's essentially in this intensification of use of the site generating journeys. Would For something like this, where it's a, a club where people would be coming and going, would we not consider that? Would there be any increase in the number of holes? If there was a, another course being provided, you might consider that it would attract potentially double the number of golfers this is providing no increase in holes um, and the application purely was considering the temporary access for bringing the material in so looking at one or two reactions of members i'm thinking they're probably all thinking the same thing as i'm thinking which is that the applicant has just come and told us that the purpose for this application coming forward is to increase the membership and increase the usage of the site, which presumably was in their um, statement when they first put their application in. Or, or do we not have a mechanism to consider that? There was nothing to indicate that the purpose of bringing in the improvements to the course was to increase visitor numbers to it. Okay. Okay, noted. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nelson, uh, sorry, just one second, Councillor Stewart, that's, go on that, that point, on that to be first. subject? Well, I saw Councillor Nelson first, if it's on the, that particular subject. I have got Councillor Melly as a substantive, and I'll note I, you I, well. I just feel like uh, it's worth kind of uh, mentioning, perhaps, that as for as long as people are coming to the site to play 18 holes of golf, uh, there can still only be one set of people per hole playing 18 holes of golf at any one time i can understand the you know from the club's perspective that you know there will be elderly members there might be struggling to get but but in terms of increased capacity at any given time it does seem fairly sensible to me that you can't suddenly have six parties on one hole playing the same round of golf simultaneously so it just seems that perhaps that's that's a reasonable kind of consideration for the that's, that's a helpful contribution thank you and councillor stewart well I, I have to screw with that i'm afraid because i'm sorry to say um i haven't played golf for years and i was absolutely rubbish when i did but you know um clearly the club is looking to increase the number of people who are members they've, they've said that and it's understandable and clearly the club is looking to have more people there for doing more rounds they wouldn't be doing this for you heard about the old population um, are they wanting to bring down so you, you can have a massive amount of variation on a tennis court for example you would have that booked for two hours for two people or two hours so, for four people or something but you need so council student I'm, I'm just gonna uh, yeah. I'm not going to disagree with anything but we're, that's a bit of sort of debate and and perhaps where we want it in terms of questions to officers which is where we are currently um you, we, obviously we asked a question we've had an answer I'm happy for you to ask a point of clarification or anything further in terms of the whys and wherefores of whether we agree or disagree, we, we can then debate when we get to debate, if you so. But if there's a question, do feel free. No? Okay. Uh, Councillor Let's try and seek clarification on that. So it's my understanding, following up agreeing with Councillor Nelson again, is that the way these are generally booked is in terms of tea time. So you would, you would book a tea time every half an hour, for, for example, setting off time. So... I'm guessing how is your view as highways that should all of those maximum tea times be booked, which it could be now, that there is sufficient capacity to deal with somebody teeing off every single tea time now. Therefore, it wouldn't be an increase in traffic from what is feasibly possible now. I think we're difficulty is is trying to conflate what the application is dealing with is in terms of the access to the delivery of material to the site to solve existing operational and drainage problems as opposed to potentially increasing users of the club and how to regulate how those members would use the club from the point of view of us examining this application it was on the process of the application was to do resolve an existing operational and drainage problem on the site and i've assessed it in that way yeah and I, I i think that that's that's clear on that uh, becky you wanted to just add yeah. something just just it's well, let's just put the nail on the head but there's no proposals for increasing the car parking there's no proposals to increase the clubhouse you pure what they have applied to us for is the redevelopment of this golf course by bringing in the materials and doing the drainage works and everything else it's not 
exactly what Ian said. It's not our understanding and what the information that we've got is that's what it's for. It's not to increase the I'm trying to think of it. it's not to increase the clubhouse, it's not to increase the car parking, it's not there's no extra capacity of those facilities. It is the redevelopment of the halls. So if I can summarize then, I think where we've reached is that the club has a capacity. It may be not reaching that capacity at the moment. The capacity and the uh, infrastructure that's around the capacity of the club isn't changing. So therefore, perhaps the argument from the uh, applicant is that they want to increase up to the existing capacity of the club. But in terms of the application and the site, that doesn't do anything to change the existing capacity. It's just about whether that capacity is utilised or not. And so then from a highways perspective, there isn't anything to assess in terms of a change in capacity because what's there existing may be used to its full capacity, but it doesn't increase its capacity. Great. I think, I think we're there on that. Councillor Nelson, is this just something additional on, on this point? Um, it was a slightly separate question in terms of the temporary access road uh, route. If it's moving on to a separate question, um, I've got Councillor Melly waiting and I'll just note you down and then we can we can go through it. So Councillor Melly. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so the applicant did say that it is, it is flooded sometimes and it basically zero capacity. So maybe it's just yeah, anyway. Um, my question um, was about condition 14 and about like the quality of the soil and um, systems that need to be in place to try and prevent um, things like invasive species. And I was just wondering how close the measures in these conditions are expected to bring the risk to zero? Like, is it just about reducing the risk a little bit or can we expect the risk to be practically removed from this condition? Because it seems like quite a big task when you're talking about screening this amount of soil this many tons and then um you know identifying any yeah in identifying any harms if it was an invasive species for example that might not become apparent until weeks or months later and it would involve monitoring a really vast area of land i'm just wondering how what if the how much risk is still remains of invasive species and how that would affect us in bulk and that sort of thing this, the CEMP includes measures to reduce risk to the lowest feasible level, uh, monitoring the, uh, the soil that's brought in and in the event of uh, anything being found, removing it, having a monitoring system in place that if there is a, an incident that it is dealt with uh, in, a, in a very specific structured way and dealt with in a specific structured way quickly. Condition 12, uh, bullet point D, refers to something called a countersigned IACPC certificate issued by Natural England, which it runs parallel with the environmental permitting system. And that covers issues in specifically in terms of the materials that are brought in. It's about lowering the risk to the lowest practical level. And uh, I think feel like as a member of the planning committee for me trying to assess this application it's helpful to know what that level of risk still is so that I can help determine whether it's an acceptable level of risk like if this is if the risk is as low as it can reasonably be but that's still quite a high risk then that's the sort of, that that's the sort of thing I'm trying to get at I think there's always going to be a risk but we're trying to mitigate it to a level that we feel is acceptable to let the development go ahead so we can't say there is going to be no risk because you bring in all these thousands of tons of soil in, but we think that these mitigation measures through the conditions are sufficient to mitigate it to a level that we think is acceptable. So does it include monitoring the soil, but then also monitoring... So I, sorry, I'm also not a soil expert and also not a plant expert, but things like Japanese knotweed, can't they grow from just like a really small bit of root? So if that was missed in the screening, you might not know about it until later once it's grown. Yeah, and then so does, is that does the monitoring and the condition include future monitoring when it's no longer soil, it's landscaping? There's an element of risk with anything and that could happen anywhere. And yes, that could happen. But 
this mitigation we think, as, along with our relevant consultees, is sufficient that we can cover as much risk as we think possible. But there will always be the possibility of that tiny grain of a knotweed. I wonder whether it's helpful um, because we've made reference to it earlier and I, and I said I would ask um, officers just to explain um, just at, at this point and, and do I will invite you to come back if there's anything further you want to ask Councillor Melly but um, I know um, initially the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust had objected to this scheme they'd then withdrawn a number of objections still had some outstanding and have subsequently withdrawn all of their objections and I just wondered um, perhaps if you could talk us through what you understand, you know, the dialogue that you've had with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, what you understand they've taken on board in terms of their assessment of, of what's going on and, and all of that sort of thing. Their view in terms of their management of the treble SI is that the risk is at an acceptable level if we put on the conditions that we have outlined, specifically condition, condition 14. In that form. And the CEMP with the, the various checks on the, the loads as they come in, on each load as it comes in, to ensure that it's not bringing anything, and also dealing with the issue potentially of, of material that has a different pH to, uh, to the, 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 the hydrology of the bog, because that's another potential issue. And are you aware of, obviously, I, I, I assume that you'll have had some dialogue with yes. Yorkshire Wildlife Trust around this. Um, are you aware of what advice they've sought? Because I, 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 I obviously, I think we're none of us around the table are going to be experts in, in a lot of this stuff. Um, I would hope that Yorkshire Wildlife Trust will have expertise, but they may, I, I, have they drawn on external expertise or I don't know how much of that information is, is helpful to in give. In respect of this, they have uh, drawn on the expertise of Natural England who deal at a higher level with uh, with countryside protection and specifically protection of areas of ancient woodland and, and treble SIs. <coughs> and they their position in terms of their consultation responses has been saying that they feel that uh, the, the level of risk is managed acceptably, providing we add in these various conditions. Okay. Uh, hopefully that's helpful in some of that. Um, I had Councillor Nelson next. Thank you. Um, in terms of the access route uh, for the goods and things being delivered, I was just wondering about whether it, you planning officers or highways had any thoughts about whether it would be worth considering attaching some sort of a condition so that that specifically sets out that route is to only be used by site traffic uh i was just you know in thinking about we all know the awkward normal a64 entrance and whether there might be some cheeky people that think oh there's an extra route here that might give us closer access to the hole i'm going to you know obviously that's not the intention for that access route to be used like that but in terms of you know conditioning it, it would that be something worth considering yes very sensible thank you so if that could be added yep. to the yeah. wording in the amendment yep. yeah, thank you um i'm looking for further questions for officers i'm not seeing any further hands going up um, I just I'm going to ask a couple of questions um, just for clarity. Um, so um, 5.37, uh, which is around the landscaping, and um, there's some direct relation in this paragraph, but there are, there are some references throughout to things being sort of short, medium and long term impacts on the environment and the harm to the green belt. And I think that the expectation, if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, is that there'll be some negative impact from the works that are undertaken, and then over a period of time, the, the, those works will then the harm will reduce and return back. It'll sort of effectively be um, returned back to a, a mature landscape. I think that's correct. Um, but short, medium, and long, I, I'm not sure what if there's a general understanding of what those timeframes are. Um, 
So if you could just explain that a little bit, that'd be helpful. There's no precise definition of short, medium and long term. However, I would like to think in terms of up to five years as being short term, five to 10 years as being long, uh, medium term, and 10 to 50, 15 years and beyond as being long term. For example, uh, a 15 year tree growth would be what you would expect uh, a, a tree to be capable of being harvested. Okay, and so um, that I think answers what was going to be my second question, which is just around paragraph 19 on page 109, which I think we've already talked a little bit about the need to tighten up some of the wording on that, but there's a reference there to trees or plants um, within a period of 15 years, and this is the perennial question of, of uh, the committee. Um, I presume that 15 years has been reached at the, the basis of a 15 years for a tree to mature. Yes, to reach the, the base of maturity. Yeah, okay. Um, and then just touching on the, the point and, and one of the questions that I was asking of the applicant, um, you know, I just, I just want to be clear that we're satisfied that all of the ways in which these conditions work, and obviously we can't condition that the entire scheme is developed in its entirety, but that phasing of the different parts of the, the scheme and making sure that the uh, impacts that happen both on the Ascan Varg and also the, the general extent of the green belt that we've got everything in place to do everything we can to make sure that the mitigations over that medium and longer term are achieved by amending condition 19 in the way that we have discussed that would ensure that the principal impact uh, of, of that nature which would be onto the landscape could be dealt with in that way Okay, thank you. So without further questions, I'll, oh, sorry. I'm sure that's the second time that's happened this evening. Go on, Councillor Merritt. Yes, just, just on page 107, the actual recommended conditions, number 13 says the content of the length shall include if required. I assume that's if required by the local planning, by ourselves, yes. the local planning authority. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Okay, so uh, I'll move us into debate then, and, and uh, just to remind members, as, as previously, um, the protocol now is that we will we will move to test the offer, officer recommendation first, so I'm happy to have indications of how people think that they feel about it, any queries, um, but we'll just hold off proposing anything at, at this stage, and I've seen Councillor Fenton's hand go first, so uh, on you go. Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think reflecting on the discussion around I suppose potential consequences of the work in terms of um, an increase in usage. The way I think the way I, I see it is, it's aimed at protecting, safeguarding the long-term sustainability of the club in terms of attracting new members to re mainly to replace some of the older ones. As as was mentioned, it's um, perhaps an aging membership. So I, I see this as a um, in terms of weighing up the benefits against <clears throat> some of the risks that have been discussed. Um, I think in terms of safeguarding the long-term long future of um, an activity which I've tried and I'm useless at, but lots of people enjoy it, and that's and that's that's great. Um, uh, and, and I'm reassured by the uh, references to the ongoing dialogue with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. I would very much hope that would continue, um, and the watching brief continue as the work gets underway um but um yeah happy to support the officer recommendation okay thank you uh councillor stewart yeah i'm um, very much the same really um i think you know i said i'm not a soil expert or anything like this but there's obviously an incredible amount of detail gone into the planning um there is an incredible amount of conditioning on the way that things worked uh, a couple of members did ask about if this was to the club was sort of not be able to do one phase or fail in some way and and sort guarantees. I don't think we we got those guarantees, but you, I don't think you can get those without escrow accounts or something like that. Uh, but that doesn't concern me. I think it is about you know a, a good club and, and doing doing the right thing for them. I was a bit confused by the highways aspect of not anticipating an increase in members when they've literally said they're looking to increase the membership. And you, and you certainly can have you know greater intensity of people. Um, you know, playing a round of golf at one time. Um, but, you know, for me, I would be supportive of this application. I suppose it may be the case that if it all goes absolutely wonderfully well and they need a new clubhouse, then at that point, there, there would be the opportunity. Um, 
so um yes i suppose depending on the outcome of this evening that that, uh, that may or may not come back here at some point um i had councillor fisher i saw your hand next and i'm just looking again for any further indications thank you um as i said earlier this all hinges for me about being as reassured as we possibly can be that there's no harm to ask and ask and bog we're not experts around this table. We don't understand soil technology. I don't think anyone will do. And um, we're not experts in hydrology. We have to put our faith in the experts who have been consulted. Um, at the end of the day, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust seem to be happy with the proposals and Natural England have not objected. So consequently, I'm quite happy to put my faith in those bodies and the expert advice. Golf is a lovely game. You can't go to St Andrews University and have a, a, a broom overlooking the old course without acquiring some love for the game. I've just never been any good at it, that's all. Um, there are a lot of people who love playing golf and having an, an improved and better golf club in the area will be a massive improvement. So I'll support it. Are you indicating, Councillor? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, uh... I'm amazed how many of you play golf, is, is all I'm going to say. It's uh, uh, not what I was expecting this evening. Um, I, I'm not seeing any further hands for, for um, comments and things. Um, I, I'll just, just check in my two panelists worth just, just briefly. I'm much the same as everybody. I, I think my sense is that if there weren't the fact that Ask and Bog was to one side, the impact on the green belt and the mitigations in place, I, I don't think would have um, any real hesitation. And, and I think, as Councillor Fisher has, has pointed out, you know, we have to defer to the experts in this. And, and my sense is that Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, if they had any anxiety about this at all, they would be leaving their objections in place. And the fact that they've worked through them all and removed them all um, gives me some confidence um, that, that they feel as confident as they can be that the impact on Ask and Bog will be negligible, minimal, or that there's sufficient um, things in place to manage that. I think also some of the tightened up wording of some of the conditions, um, as we've discussed this evening, um, again, just gives me that that little extra confidence as well. So um, if I can invite somebody, um, as I say, we first of all need to just test the officer recommendation. So I've seen Councillor Stewart looking. I'll tee off, Chair. Sorry. See, I'm, I'm getting well, that was the obvious, bingo card yeah, out really now for all these sub Sorry. jokes. Yeah. We needed a few puns. Okay. Uh, and I'll move the officer recommendation. Okay. And Councillor Fisher, your hand was next. Thank you. I'll second that we put this to the vote for approval. Uh, Councillor Nelson, do you want to make Please a withering the remark? Condition, the amendments. Sorry, yes, we, I'll, I'll, we'll go to that. So it's been proposed and seconded uh, that we go with the officer recommendation along with the uh, amendments uh, to conditions that we've discussed. So, uh, Becky, if you can just talk us through specifically what's being voted on. Okay, so the conditions in the report and the amended conditions in the additional information also changes to condition three to limit the construction access to only construction vehicles and the removal of the access once the site's brought into use. Sorry, no, yes, removal of that access once the works are brought into use. And then changes to condition 19 to reflect the phasing of the development and then to get a timetable for the landscaping to come forward. Yeah. Councillor? Pedant point, should it be construction related vehicles? I just don't want for I'll, individuals with us that are probably involved in construction and they wouldn't be allowed to drive onto the site. Construction related vehicles, okay. Okay, so uh, as, as set out uh, by Becky there, if I can see by show of hands all of those who are in favour of that proposal. Yeah. Any against? Any abstention? Okay, so that is approved unanimously. And I'll just reiterate, if I can, the point that was made about that importance of the ongoing dialogue with Yorkshire Water, and if that can be fed back to the club and, and others um, throughout. Wildlife Trust. Oh, I've said I've said water again. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. I see YW and I think of Bill's. Apologies, you don't need to speak to Yorkshire Water, but Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, that's, that's who I mean. So um, it is 
Uh, 10 past seven, I'm going to suggest we have a five minute adjournment uh, before moving on to the final item. So if we could come back at quarter past seven, please.
Right, welcome back everybody to this evening's meeting of Planning Committee A. I'm Councillor Johnny Croshaw, as the chair of the committee. Um, we, before we move on to agenda item 4C, uh, have lost our vice chair as he uh, declared earlier on that he needed to withdraw. So the first thing that we just need to do is elect a new uh, vice chair. Uh, I believe there's been a bit of a conversation, but if I can have a proposal for the vice chair, please. Come on, somebody propose Councillor Fenson. <laughs> Sorry, who are you? I'll propose Councillor Fenson. Thank Sorry. you very much. And a second, yeah, and uh, I can just see by nod, everybody's happy with that. Councillor Fenton, should anything need to go to chair and vice chair, it will be uh, you and I on this one. So uh, we move on then to agenda item 4C, which is the uh, self-storage self facility at uh, Talthorpe, Talthorpe Moor Lane, Strensel. And uh, if I can invite uh, Victoria Bell as the Development Management Officer, who has joined us again at the table just to uh, talk us through any updates. And uh, between yourself and Becky, if you can speak through the plans. Um, there's there's no committee update. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> the application is for exchange of use of agricultural land to the siting of 118 storage containers and its retrospective. This is your application site here, outlined in red. This is the site entrance from Tothorpe Road. Tothorpe Road, you said that right? Tothorpe, thank you. And that's the site entrance and the approach in. You can see the buildings in here. The containers, containers in situ on the left-hand side here. I don't know if that's the yeah, left-hand side too. And then the containers sited externally. On the right hand side, you can see they're all on the hard standing. Again, building con buildings containing the containers. And again, vehicles being stored at the site as well. And that's the view of the site from the road. You can just see yeah. from the north. And then again, from the east of the site, that's still in the field to the rear. And again, looking over the site. So this is the site layout plan. You can see access in through here and a development within there. I think this is a better one. Yep. Yeah. So you can see all of the containers within the buildings there and the containers on the existing hard standing. That's it for me. Thank you. Hey, um, so this is uh, the point where we ask for any questions on the plans. I'm just going to jump in for a point of clarification. So the uh, there's the request is for 118 storage containers. Um, obviously, on the plans, there's some that are inside a building and some that are outside. Is the 118 the total number, including what's within the buildings, or is it just the ones that are on the outside? In 2017, 22 storage containers were approved within the building, so it's an additional 118 containers to that. So, okay, so... Just to be completely clear, those that we see on the photograph in the building already have planning permission. Twenty-two of them do. Ah, okay. So there's additional build, additional within the building, and additional on the hard standing outside. They, they've applied for 118 storage containers on the agricultural land. They haven't applied for within the building. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, just inviting questions, Councillor Eyre. It's just on those pictures because there's the one which is like containers with a wooden front and then that building which has sides is that like a... no. <laughs> sorry that's two photos that white line doesn't it, it does it, <laughs> it doesn't no. well, i didn't get that right. i couldn't see is no. that is that just a frontage on the left hand side no it's it, the building it's it goes all the way around those photos together yeah. it makes it look yeah it's wrong it's so that is the building that's that on the other exactly one it's all the way yes <laughs> Uh, Councillor Stewart. Yeah, just on the storage of the vehicles, what's the law on, on that? This application is just for the storage of the containers. It's not for the vehicles. We've just shown that they've been stored there. I don't know if they're still there, to tell you the truth. Um, you can... Law, change of use, depends what they're being used for. We haven't gone down that alley because we've looked at what they've applied for. And what they've applied for is the containers. 
Okay, Councillor Nelson. Um, would you be able to just, with your little pointer, uh, highlight, um, if you go back to the plan, how much of that is, is all of that outside of the building now hard standing? The, the hard standing that's discussed in this papers, is it all of that boundary? Yes. If you give me a minute, I'll get you an aerial shot. Thank you. Just while Becky's doing that, is there any further questions that people have at this stage? Councillor Fenton, just on the plan, by the way, I know there's already. Is, um, is any of the site within the boundaries of Strensel Common? I'm assuming not, but I just want to double check. I couldn't confirm or deny that. Okay, and I've just done a quick count up and I make that there are 22 containers within the building. So I think yeah. that's the prior planning approval. Um, and there's one other um, sort of shape just to the right of the plan of the building that is coloured grey like the containers, but looks to be a different size and shape. I don't know. Has some words in it, but they're too small for us to read on the on the paper. I don't know if you happen to know what that is. I'm assuming it's a building, possibly the office or something like that. I don't know. But I, I can double check with the, uh, the applicant. It's just understanding what what has consent at the moment and what's being sought consent for. So I think. Councillor? You're confusing me now. I thought on page 134, the 22 was withdrawn. I can't see the one where 22 has been approved. Is that... So if you look in the planning history, there's um, yeah. uh, one that was withdrawn. So page 134, 1 1.8. Yeah. The first one was approved. Well, the first one on the list, which I think uh, that, that's uh, I the see. most recent one was approved, but the, the prior one in 2017 was withdrawn. Oh, farm it right there we go. Joe, I think there may have been a question earlier about whether or not the site falls within Strensel Common. There was, yes. Paragraph 1.2 of the report does say that it is falls within or is adjacent to Strensel Common on page 133. Just the reason I ask because it, <clears throat> elsewhere it, it refers to the site being adjacent to and within the impact zone for Strensel Common. And on the first page, it, it says is within slash adjacent to. I just wanted confirmation whether which it is. <laughs> so, in, so there's two questions that are pending at the moment. Yeah, and, uh, so, I mean, I, I think the special area of conservation, which is also uh, which is Strensel Common, and can is can be um, different to what is considered Strensel Common in the other sense. Um, in this term of the special area of conservation, it is adjacent to, and it's within the impact zones. Yeah. There you go. Here's your aerial view. You can see. That site, so it's all hard standing in terms of the red line that you can see. I'll scroll out so you can see it in the wider context. Mm -hmm. So there's the barracks there. That's the site. You can see. Scroll, scroll back in a bit further so you can see it. But yeah. That's what it is. Okay, so uh, in lieu of any further questions on the plans, uh, I'll invite the public speakers to now come to the table. So uh, we have Simon Dunn, who is the applicant, who is going to be addressing the committee. And then we've got Killian Gallagher, who is the agent, uh, who's going to be here available for questions. Uh, so Mr Dunn, um, thank you very much for waiting all of this time. 
Um, you'll have heard me say previously, but you have three minutes uh, to address the committee and no pressure, but everybody else has been absolutely spot on the three minutes. Um, but I will give you a heads up if I think you're going on too, too far, if you'd like to just start in your own time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Since 1994, I've been tenant on the MOD property at Strensel, known as Lambs Hill Farm, farm in the area known as Strensel Common. In 1998, World's End, which backs onto the Common, was added from Forest Enterprise. In 2010, due to our experience managing Strensel Common, we were offered 300 acres of Strayland, Hobmoor, Warmgate, Bootham, Monk's Cross, from York City Council, which we farm now. The combination of both farming areas gives us an area of approximately 1,900 acres spread all the way around York. It takes the livestock manager four hours every day just to check all the fields with livestock in them. Then the manager must be available for call outs, animals escaping, gates left open, dog issues, etc. Farm subsidies have seriously reduced since 2020 and will be phased out completely by 2027. The government has been encouraging all farmers to diversify to mitigate the loss of the subsidies. The conservation farming we practice on the common and strays does not allow us to increase production to justify our full-time livestock manager. We needed an alternative income and considered a few options, but felt there was a real need for self-storage north of York in 2016. I approached the MOD, who is our landlord, who has been very supportive and encouraged us all the way. In 2017, we were granted permission to operate BHE self-storage out of Lambs Hill. Since then, and especially through lockdown, we put down more containers to satisfy demand. Storage demand is 50% domestic, people moving houses, etc., and 50% small businesses. We have award-winning businesses plus nationally recognised businesses using our site, supporting all areas of business in York. We gave containers for the UK and drop-off donations for over a year in 2022, a real focal point of the community. This farm diversification has worked very well with our farming activities. The big plus of on-farm storage is that we meet all our customers. Customers are only allowed on site during 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and all have to sign a contract. We are not interested in 24-7 storage. If we hadn't diversified, we would not be managing the common, world's end or the strays. It is as simple as that. The livestock man manager can't work anywhere else as he has to be on call for North Yorkshire Police, the RSPCA, York City Council, MOD, and finally, you, the public. The income from the storage creates more margin than the 350 cattle and 500 yarn, but that allows us to manage all the conservation grazing as the landlords and public want. You can start without, winding up now, please. Without the guaranteed income, farm subsidies, conservation grazing would be totally uneconomic. Diversification has provided the income to replace the lost subsidy payments and it is also providing a service for York. The containers are, are located within the existing farmstead and not visible from the road. Since 2017, we have operated without a single complaint from neighbours. I ask today for you to support this application, which will allow farm diversification to continue and enable me to continue farming in York. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'm afraid you did go a little bit over the uh, three minutes, but I thought, seeing as how it's us in the room, it's uh, it's uh, you've waited long enough. So uh, yeah. So I just invite any questions from members. I can see Councillor Eyre uh, has got a hand up. Yeah, hopefully a quickish one. How many storage facility sites do you operate, and what in particular evidence did you get that this was the right site to have another one? It's B BHE storage, isn't it? Is the, is the organisation? How many sites does BHE storage operate in? In the we have two sites. We have two sites. We have one where I live at home, and then we have this one at Strensel. And what research did you do to look into the fact that there was identified needs specifically at that Strensel site? The Strensel site stood out completely to me, and when we started with the Strensel one, I realised it 
we would try to because I live in a very rural location and it and it's working well there as well. But the Strensel site is a lot bigger. You know, we only have 30, 38 containers at our other where I live. Okay, any further questions, Councillor Fenton? Thank you. The <clears throat> the report talks about the the hard standing that it's suggested it was put down in 2015. Um what was there before? Was it was it um uh, just kind of <clears throat> open the, the hard standing was put down in 2009 okay and we uh farmed it we had 900 cattle on the site at one stage only lasted for about three years because it was the best way to blow money there was but as i say the storage is it's far cleaner it, it it's just better for everything you know we have no rats we have no effluent it's just it just works very well. It's a quick follow up. So in terms of the, the use of the site for farming purposes, is it <clears throat> mainly to serve the um, the livestock that you graze on the common? Is that the main, in terms of the agricultural uses of, of the current site, in addition to the the unit is the is the yes it, yeah. we, we we are i mean the the common is the biggest you know it's 1500 acres the stray land is 300 acres but the stray land around york is a very big commitment because it takes a lot of managing and we have a lot you know a lot of issues and you know we're doing our best and as i say my, i'm i'm tenant to york city council and you know i have to do what they say and and, and we do it but it's completely uneconomic if we were just to rely on the income from the farming, we used to get a good subsidy, which used to subsidize our farming, and we're going to lose that now. We, it's 50% reduced by 2027, it's gone completely. And you know what I mean? If, if I didn't have the storage, or if I hadn't diversified, we won't be farming you know, the strays. Strays would be the first thing to go if, if, if you know, because it just it's uneconomic, and that's end of story. Okay, Councillor Nelson, thank you. Um, sorry, just, just one second. Brilliant. Just one sorry, Councillor, I just want to follow up on the uh, the hard standing. The hard standing is not only immune from enforcement action due to the period it's been installed. It would could well have been permitted development, agricultural permitted development in any way, which wasn't quite presented in the officer's report. In addition. The that land can be stacked three or four deep around bales of silage, or you can have nine hundred cattle uh, chewing on it for the winter. So when I said in in my planning statement, and the officer quoted part of it in her officer's report to committee, when you think of this as open and green belt terms, it's not quite. It, it's agricultural land. It it's a, a built up farmyard. It's not a pristine field that this man has paved over and filled with containers. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Nelson. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is in this, uh, it talks about tree and shrub and bush planting. Uh, I wanted to know whether that's been done. Thank you. There, there has been some planting, Councillor. In addition, during the application, I asked the architect to prepare a, an additional, a new plan, showing her a, a more enhanced a planting scheme. Some of the photos that Ms. Zeed's referred to as being from the road or actually from the fields out the back, but they're common. So, you know, you could hypothetically walk along there and you can see a bit of the containers over the top of the fence. So during the consideration of the application, we submitted an additional drawing showing an enhanced planting scheme. Okay. Uh, okay. We're just pulling up some photos. Uh, well, uh, Becky's pulling up those photos. Can I ask my other question? Thank you. Um, Please let me know if this isn't an appropriate question. But um, the other thing that I was really wondering is, did you consider applying for planning permission for these containers? And if so, why not? Or, you know, were you aware that you needed planning permission for these containers outside on the uh, farmyard? Yeah, really is that just? Uh, I was going to say, I think we probably can't really go into that in a way because our job is to look at the application that sits before us and. Whatever, I don't know what conversation has happened to this point, but we are now assessing a retrospective application. So we don't Thank really you. need to know I how we got here. We just need we to assess new, what's, I, what's I here. Am new to that. Okay. 
we're just uh, waiting on the windows of technology to bring the photographs up for uh were there any further questions uh from members i don't think that there are so uh, i think these photos are just for information not for expecting anything yeah, further in terms of what was there yeah in, in which case um i can thank you both for coming this evening um if you uh, would like to again retire to the to the public gallery and uh, obviously we'll uh, continue uh, through the meeting So if you could just Sorry. explain what we're looking at. So that that was stood in the field at the back of where of where the um, storage containers are. Um, apologies, this isn't the best way of going through them, but I can only do it this way. Um, so yeah, you can see that there's the um, there's the fencing. I'm not really sure that there's any plant in there yet that I could see. Um, just let me go through them again. There you go. So you can see there's not, it's, it is just that fencing and that's stood in the field at the back. Okay. So I think it's probably maybe helpful just to understand. So in terms of the things that would or wouldn't require planning permission, mm -hmm. that fence that's been put around the site, could that fence have been put in place uh, to support the agricultural use or would, would that require a uh, oh, is it? Uh, it's over two meters high, so it need permission anyway. Okay. Um, I've been told. Okay. I didn't stand next to it for proof. Just <laughs> yeah. thank you. Okay, so um, if uh, members have any questions, uh, members have any questions for officers uh, on the report itself, or any points of clarification uh, they want to raise, now is your time. Councillor Whitcroft. Thank you very much. Um, page 144.5.35. Um, I just wanted to ask if there was anything a bit further we could find out about the reason that farm diversification wasn't considered uh, a good enough reason or, or, or had that sort of objection, because as far as I can see, there is quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of um, farming land that is that is used and that is sub, sub, to an extent subsidized that is supported by the business um here and i was just wondering whether there was a sort of a limit or a reason why that amount of land wasn't considered necessary or was at least considered reasonable for the reduction of or the removal of the very special circumstances we, ha we have taken it into the balance and we've given it moderate weight. However, we didn't consider that it outweighed the harm to the green belt. I can see people with sort of scrunched faces. I, I saw Councillor Nelson and Councillor Eyre. I don't know if uh, you're both wanting the same question. I'm just probably, probably a question for Sandra. That, that, that financial burden would fall back on the local authority, wouldn't it? I just what kind of a strange situation that puts us in in terms of I mean yeah, the, the uh, argument is that should should the business yeah, fail so, then the council would have to pick up the cost of maintaining the strays. I don't think that would be material planning consideration. The, the information that was sit, that was submitted from memory um they they said that they looked after this land but there's very little you know they said there was very little with that they didn't sort of explain further what impact that would have so i suppose then from it's difficult to um, assess in terms of um, Sandra's suggesting that the element around the uh, impacts to the council is not a material consideration. Um, 
what you're saying is that you may or may not have considered any further information to be material or otherwise, but you that wasn't presented. So the information that was the supporting information is what's led you to the yes, assessment. We, we based it on the information that was submitted to us, um, that they farmed this land, but there, there was no sort of further inference that um, they wouldn't be able to farm this land if this didn't go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Whitcroft, I'm going to come back to you and I've noted you, Councillor Nelson, as well. Thank you. So I, 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 don't, I don't know whether that's... So the, my, my reading of it was that if this financial support is not available from this particular business, then they won't be able to continue to work with that land, or is that just still not, remains not material risk at all? So where, where are you taking that from? If you could just clarify, this is a page for 144. Yeah, paragraph still, five, three, still on two. this, yeah, on, on the same area. 535, isn't it? Farm diversification, the storage business financially subsidises the environmental stewardship of the common and the city strays. I read into financially subsidised as sort of depend. Well, I suppose it, it might be subjective, but dependent upon. But I don't know whether that's. Yeah, it reads that he need the storage business is is needed in order for him to be able to continue to maintain the strays for the city council. It just puts us in a very odd position. I think the issue is that we've not maybe had that level of detail that we had tonight from the applicant. So that obviously you've heard that tonight from the applicant, so you can consider that now. Um, that given what he's done, uh, what he said in terms of the, um, and that's that's for you now as your balance in terms of we've made you can't we've made a recommendation based on the information that Victoria's considered, and then gone with the balance. Whereas you've obviously had the information about the diversification and how it's how it's then being supported. What I would say, you, you, oh, sorry, I can't make that come back on. Um, you, you can, you can consider that that's a very special circumstances, but it's very specific to this applicant and what it's going to be used for. Does that make sense? So, I, I see the route that you, you potentially would go down. That you think there are, a, there is a very special circumstance, but you would need to potentially think about that it's only for this instance and for the farm diversification, you wouldn't want another self-storage business to come on here and then just run as a self-storage business because then where's your very special circumstance? Your very special circumstance is that this money is going back into the strays and everything that the gentleman said tonight. I don't think that we've got anything that ties that enough at this moment in time, hence why we've made our recommendation. Does that make sense? So I think um, the thought that I would have on that is that if this was a different application, um, you know, we obviously we've had a number of applications on various different things where the applicant will talk about the financial situation and that that's why, a, you know, an affording, affordable housing element should or shouldn't be included. And at that point, we'd potentially seek further um, financial information or go to the district valuer or, or you know do those sorts of things um i i think i would perhaps defer in terms of just some advice from the solicitor around um what would make a safe robust decision in terms of a level of information that would warrant a, a special circumstance um and I'm just going to pause for one second. Yeah. So if the committee was minded that that they thought would amount to a special circumstance, um, it might be appropriate to defer pending the receipt of that information to then assess whether it genuinely is a, a special circumstance or not. I don't know if um, there's any legal perspective that you want to add to that or if that's... No. Um, okay. Councillor, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, no, I, I really don't, um, and, and just to reiterate what I said right at the top, this is a business meeting that's in public, and, and from that point, I appreciate it can sometimes be tricky. Um, yeah. You could defer it for that, um, and we'd 
potentially advise you if you were going to go down that route we may need some kind of tie-in agreement with the applicant that it tied it if that's the if that's the instruction that you give us to go away and because you feel that there may be very special circumstances but you want to know whether or not we can tie it you might need to tie it to the applicant because it, any other self storage unit may not be acceptable <laughs> no, so sorry that was my i, I don't mind bringing you back in in, in a second but it's, so, i don't want to have no no it's fine i was just looking well. I, I was looking at it but um there is ways around it potentially so, if, so but if you make that decision yeah so so the point i just want to make is we're in questions at the minute we're seeking clarification if we want to debate we're hearing some possible things there may be other things that we may also want to take into consideration and to debate so if anybody needs any further clarification on some of what's been said happy to to, to take that uh councillor Aaron, and then i'll come to you councillor Nelson. it was it was clarity around the farm diversification aspect of it because ordinarily every other application we've had that involves farm diversification relates to the land itself i've never come across one this is very bizarre that it's asking to sustain a farm that is somewhere in a completely different location, owned by someone completely different. I don't see how MPPF legislation allows you to set up a business on one piece of land to help diversify diversify your piece of land in order to do something to somebody else's land inside of the city, which may or may not, the tenancy could be ended at any point as well by the city council. And he would have, is that a common thing? Somebody to seek to support somebody else's farming from a separate, completely separate location. Yeah, hence why we made the recommendation for refusal, yeah. because we didn't have that level of... It's really difficult in planning terms. That's what I've just been trying to say to you. In We didn't have enough, we didn't feel, to justify the approval on a piece of land that's unacceptable in greenbelt terms when we didn't have something to tie it to there's no how how do we as a as a planning we've got no information of how we tie that any revenue from this goes to the strays it then becomes a whole legal i'm looking at sandra at this point a whole legal planning complex issue that we haven't got to hence why we recommended refusal because we weren't there in terms of tying one to the other we just it becomes far more complex. What we're considering is this piece of land and whether or not it's acceptable in the green belt. No, it isn't in terms of our considerations and balance. You can go the other way, but that's how we've got there. And Sandra's going to come in now and say something. Well, no, just, just to add, Chair, if I may, um, just to add that um, it is, the onus is on the applicant to provide the factors that might give rise. So it's um, no criticism of um, the authority. No. No, thank, you, thank you for making that point. I'm going to come to Councillor Nelson, who I think also had a supplementary. I've seen your hand as well, Councillor Stewart, and I welcome to you. Thank you, Chair. I, I wanted to ask kind of on this, in terms of the, the weighting of things uh, and the discussion of specifically the harm to the green belt, is it not the case that the harm to the green belt, or particularly I'm thinking maybe in ecological terms, um, has happened when the hard standing went down? Uh, no, okay. Yeah, thank you. It's not just harm in terms of the, the, it's the openness as well. So obviously you've got the containers stored on there, but you've also got the fact that the principle is unacceptable so it is inappropriate so yeah. it's it there's multiple factors as to why it's not acceptable in green belt terms and one of the key things here as well that we really need to consider is that idea of precedent isn't it um or yeah well you no know, yes i know because you have to consider the individual very special circumstances that they've given you and that won't set a precedent because they are, are individual to this case so, but then you are looking at development in the green belt where you've considered very special circumstances and which way you fall. Whereas we've obviously considered the very special circumstances and gone, actually, we don't think that they're strong enough to for, to outweigh all the harms that we've outlined to you in the report. Okay, Councillor Stewart. Yeah. 
Thank you. Although that was an entirely legitimate question, I do feel generally we're moving towards debate. Um, if we're not, then shut me up. But if we are, I'd like to move things forward. You'd like to get into debate. OK, point, point noted. Um, any further questions, uh, specific points or any, anything on the report from anybody? No, in which case, Councillor Stewart, would you like to open the debate? Thank you, yeah. Um, I mean, massively sympathise with um, the applicant's circumstances, but I do feel we do not have the detail for why this is so exceptional um, to justify what is clearly an appropriate development in the Green Belt. Um, I do think it will set a precedent. You know, we know that farmers don't have it easy. And if any farmer knows that they can just say, well, the farmer is struggling and therefore um, I'll put some storage units up or whatever it may be. Uh, and then there's the whole area about if we do step into this, um, you know, I'll have an illegal planning activity, but I'll do some good elsewhere. We're going into an absolutely incredible minefield, in my view, going forward about what illegal activity you can get away with to do some good elsewhere. So I would very happily move refusal. OK, noted. I'm not going to take that as a proposal at the moment, but when we come back, I will. Uh, Councillor Ayer, I think you're indicating as well. The first time this evening, my pen's nodding in agreement with Councillor Stewart. I think my first gut feeling when I read this was that we have a good system in place and this should really have gone to the Office of Refusal. And the applicant has that opportunity, if they disagree with that decision, to go through the planning appeal process, which I think would have been the correct process. It's disappointing in a way that due to a member of the council, it's had to come to committee and we've had to have the time and effort into, into debating that in such a way. It is, on the base of the evidence that we've got, a totally straightforward case of of refusal, the very special circumstances aren't here, and evident it's not for us to try and find them or to try and put them in after the fact. It's as the solicitor said, it's for the applicant to to demonstrate them. They haven't. The issue around the city strays is very weird, and that's one of the reasons why I also think appeal would be a, would be a better option because it takes us out of that decision making process and any suggestion that the council might be doing it for financial benefit in terms of getting a subsidised cost of, of maintaining the stray so i think i would definitely agree with with cross steward and go for refusal and allow it to adapt with through through planning appeal if necessary okay any further contributions to debate councillor fenton <clears throat> i don't think it's quite as straightforward as um as councillor as yes I, I don't discount the <clears throat> farm diversification point i i admit this is a strange argument to make in terms of <clears throat> um, a commercial activity would support farming activity not on this site but elsewhere it, in, a, in a way it's kind of unhelpful that that other activity is undertaken on behalf of the council because I think that does put in a us in a um, a difficult situation from a, a planning perspective um, but I don't think it's one that we should we should overlook in terms of um, the importance of sustaining the farming, the farming of, of of the land, which which creates helps create the natu natural environment. So, I'm I'm not quite as quick to dismiss um, whether very spe special circumstances do exist, um, and uh, it's it's unfortunate that <clears throat> officers didn't have the opportunity to consider some of the additional information that has come forward at this evening's meeting, uh, and and I feel I would like to. Um, have the benefit of, of them being able to, to look at that and consider both from a planning and legal perspective <clears throat> um, the extent to which that could be taken into account in forming a recommendation. So um, I would be happy with a deferral if others would support that. Councillor Nelson. Thank you. Um, I also don't think, I think it, it is complicated and I'm glad that everyone else is thinking that this is a strange application. Um, you know, it's, I think where I'm at on this is there's clearly a real point to be made about um, diversification of farming, but there's also clearly a really important point to be made about the green belt and protecting it. Um, and it seems to me that the crux of this is where the weight is. And I, you know, on reading this, that's what I wanted to test to us, you know, in a way. And I think the discussions that we've had and the answers from officers and things like that make it clear that without information which isn't here, I feel like the weight has been 
given in your reports appropriately as it is at the moment, which is a shame because perhaps there are other, you know, perhaps there is other information out there that might have changed the conversation, but it's not here. And, um, you know, so I think I'm leaning towards supporting the offer to, officer recommendation on that. If it's if the information hasn't been provided, then we can't take it into account. I also think there is something, it says something in here about, I know I asked about shrubs, but about how actually because it's a retroactive planning application, some of that could have been done, but it doesn't seem to have been done. And, uh, you know, so that's something that, again, can't be taken into account because it hasn't happened. Uh, so, yes, I think that's where I am at with it, but I don't feel easy about it, perhaps. Um, I will come to you in a moment, Councillor. I just if there's anybody else who wants to contribute who hasn't contributed. So, Councillor. I think just in response to Councillor Fenton, I think the issue I have with that is making an argument that there is a need to financially sustain that part of the business is absolutely fine. And yes, I need an additional income to allow me to do that. That doesn't then say that it has to be on that particular site. Well, there needs to be a site specific allocation. And then maybe maybe brownfield sites where you could open a storage unit, which would then cross subsidize it. You have to be able to demonstrate that that particular site is a necessary for the financial sustainability of everything else, and b the only site available for the business to use in terms of that one. And that's why the diversity case is not on the same site, because if you're converting your farmlands to a campsite, for example, that's your land. That's the only land you have. That's the only place you can build a campsite. This isn't necessarily of that because it's subsidising something elsewhere. So I think that's where the difference lies. If there was evidence that this was the only site that you could have storage containers on to cross subsidise that, then I think yes. But it just doesn't seem to be there at the moment, and that's why I wouldn't support deferral and we'll actually go straight to refusal. Okay, um, I'm just going to say from my point of view, I, I think you know that that paragraph five point three five, you know it. it I've, I've just reread it and I think that um, a lot of emphasis has been put on the, the divers, diversification and the, and the implications. Um, I think if it was such a critical element, I would have expected every bit of information to have been put forward ahead of this, well, you know, as part of this report being written, um, possibly once the report was published. Um, and the fact that it's afforded moderate weight anyway within this report um, I think ultimately, you know, these greenbelt decisions can be really difficult sometimes. And, you know, the, the the way the legislation is set is that you have to have, it's not just a special circumstance, it is a very special circumstance. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't see that having been met um, this evening. Um, I think it's, for me, if this had been the absolute crux of it, then every bit of information would have been put forward because that's the way that most other applicants do. I think sometimes when you get to a point where here's a bunch of reasons what's going to give us our best um, angle on things, that's my anxiety in it. And I, I take the points that have been made around the specific site and it clearly causes harm in the green belt. Does it have to cause harm in the green belt for the that diversification to happen I, i'm not convinced of that so um the system is uh, i invite a proposal um to test the officer recommendation i think councillor steward you'd indicated that um if you could just formally yeah, propose refusal and happy to second chair yeah thank you so uh becky if you can just summarize what's been proposed and seconded So the recommendation is on page 146 to refuse the application for the three reasons out, three reasons outlined on page 146 and 147. Thank you. Okay, so if by show of hands, I can see all those who are in favor of the proposal, if you could show now, please. All those who are against. And any abstention? No. So that application is refused in line with the officer recommendation. Okay, so that brings us to the end of agenda item four. Agenda item five is urgent business and there is none. Uh, so I can thank you all for your time this evening and bring the meeting.